fucking moment. Welcome to the Farm and Cottage Food Safety <coughs> Workshop. Some of you know me, some of you don't. My name is Holly Mobby. I work for Dakota College at Botno, and I am the director of the Entrepreneurial Center for Horticulture. Through that center, we work with small producers and small farms all across the state to help them with their business planning, um, their business record keeping, marketing, production, um, as well as on campus we have a fully functioning uh, demonstration site where we have high tunnels and production areas where we grow a lot of vegetables and um, do all sorts of things to try and uh, make sure we're walking the walk and talking the talk for producers. In addition to that, I am North Dakota's only uh, certified lead trainer for the Food Safety Modernization Act Produce Rule. And last but maybe not least, um, when we talk about walking the walk and talking the talk, my husband and I are also producers and we've been in business for 15 years and we grow culinary herbs and sell them to grocery stores and restaurants and direct to consumers. So I've, I've been in the shoes and am in the shoes um, that, that follow these rules and regulations. So that's me, but helping me today is Jamie and I'm going to let you come up and introduce yourself. I'm Jamie Calavera. I'm one of the inspectors here at First District Health Unit. And uh, for anybody that doesn't know, First District Health Unit is the local health department that covers Botno, Burke, McLean, McHenry, Renville, Sheridan, and Ward counties. And uh, we work with food safety with uh, anybody that's in our counties, and that goes all the way to cottage foods and food producers. So that's Thanks. what we do. Yeah. Jamie's going to make sure I, I stay on task and on topic, and he's here to um, speak to some of the First District Health Unit guidelines and, we'll, and we want to make sure that we have our local and state folks on hand for these workshops when we can so that you can specifically ask questions of them so you can get to know them. Um, sometimes what we find with producers, uh, if we say, oh, you know, you need to talk to your health unit, it becomes this big scary thing and we want you to see that um, Jamie and Carolyn are not scary at all. All right. So first of all, these are the topics we're going to cover. Why should food safety concern me? Outbreaks of foodborne illness, which regulations apply to me? And that's where we're gonna make sure we slow down just a little bit so we can get all of the, the questions answered and be very clear on the regulations. FSMA, F-S-M-A is the Food Safety Modernization Act. Of course, the North Dakota Cottage Foods regulations, any local regulations that are out there, and then some labeling laws and guidelines. And we, we want to take our time and make sure that we answer all of those questions fully and completely before we move on. Then once we're done with that, we're going to move to the six areas of BISMA, Food Safety Modernization Act, and GAP, which stands for Good Agricultural Practices that affect producers, and that's worker training, health and hygiene, agricultural water, biological soil amendments, domesticated and wild animals, equipment, tools, and buildings, and record keeping. That's, that's where we're gonna pick up the speed just a little bit, um, because in a workshop like this in four hours, there's no way we can cover all of the food safety or all of the, the GAP guidelines, but we want you to have an understanding of what they are, and to be able to implement some of those practices on your farm if you need to, okay? So we're gonna start right away with why do we need food safety training. Um, mainly it comes about because of our concern for foodborne illness, and right now is a great time to be thinking about that. Uh, we were just talking about you know the flu going around and colds and all of those things. It doesn't just happen in the winter, it happens all year round. Annually one out of six individuals get sick um, from foodborne illness, 13,000 or 130,000 are hospitalized and there are 3,000 deaths. And those are just the ones that are reported. Um, I think we may have all experienced that one time we went out to eat or something and, and then, then we weren't feeling quite well, but we weren't feeling bad enough to report it. Um, and it still may have been a foodborne uh, illness that was causing us to not feel well. A large number of food board illnesses are not reported. Particularly at risk are the children, elderly, and those with compromised immune systems. And I, and I know that as producers of food, we all want to uh, 
make sure that we protect those those people, you know, the elderly and the children. The last thing we want to do is make some little kid or some older person ill. Foodborne diseases can happen in any size of operation. I know we hear in the news a lot that, oh, the closer you are to the source of your few food, the fewer number of people have handled it, the, the safer it is, but that's not always the case. Foodborne illnesses can happen at any size. And the last thing any of us as producers want is to be that farm, right? That, that hits the news, that hits the, the front page of the Minot Daily or, or the, the local magazine. And, and it's happened. It's happened in this district and it's, it's happened in other places around the state. So the last thing we want to be is, is that farm or that producer. Outbreaks associated with produce in particular, and I know some of you do, do eggs or, or other products as well, um, but just looking at the produce, uh, if you take a look at that, the FDA outbreaks linked to produce, 25% of them were sprouts. We're not going to cover sprouts today because sprouts are specifically regulated in the state of North Dakota under a different set of rules. Um, but leafy greens is, a, is 25%. And I look at what I do and I, I grow herbs, but that's a type of leafy green, and I know some of you in here also grow leafy greens. 25% of the outbreaks. I know there are things on this list that, that we don't grow here, like papayas, but if you look at tomatoes are the next, you know, 10%. We grow those, we grow melons, that's another 10%. Um, so the types of produce that could be prone to food outbreaks, foodborne illnesses, um, definitely are products that we grow here in North Dakota. So what happens um, when an outbreak is found? Someone does get ill, what happens? First, the North Dakota State Department of Health initiates an investigation. Then Traceback determines the route back to the farm. In other words, um, maybe Jamie, you want to speak to, to this a little bit? Well, you know, the, the epidemiologist, <coughs> the State Department of Health, they would open it up and then Traceback would come to usually the local health department. So our inspectors would be working, the epidemiologists say we need to find where this came from and then they send us out and we try and find if there's lot numbers or batch numbers or whatever we can find, you know, invoices and try and find where it came from and follow it back, like you said, right back to the farm if that's where it started. Once that's determined, the location of where that product originated at is determined, that initiates some immediate action to, to recall any of the others from that lot or from that group, um, from that field, that was harvested on that day um, so that no one else gets sick. And implementation, implementation of rapid response serves to, to keep it from spreading. Um, and then, lastly, preventative and corrective action need to be taken so that it doesn't happen again. And that's where, if you are the farmer that produced that or the, the rancher or whatever that, that made that product, um, you're going to have to make sure those corrective actions are taken. So microorganisms of concern, we have three different areas. We have bacteria, we have viruses, and we have parasites. And of course, the list that we have here are just some of the more common ones. It's not all inclusive, but we hear all the time about Salmonella, E. coli. Um, we hear about norovirus, especially this time of year, and Giardia. Bacteria are microorganisms that can multiply both inside and outside of a host. So that's really important to know in that um, they multiply and they multiply very rapidly. They include the things that I just mention, mentioned, the E. coli, the salmonella, um, and the right conditions for their multiplication are water, food, and proper temperature. And we'll talk about those three things in a minute. Um, good agricultural practices that we'll be learning uh, in the later part of this session today um, can reduce that risk by minimizing situations that support their growth. Here's how fast they grow. If you think about the number of bacteria being just two in 20 minutes, by the time you get to an hour, eight. But by the time we get to four hours, 4,096, and by the time we get to eight hours, 16,777,000. 
Think about your process and your operation. When you go out and you pick your produce, how long is it from when you're picking that to when your customer is purchasing it? So even if you only, you know, you've done the things that you think are right and the things that you can do to minimize bacteria, if the bacteria is there when you pick it, it is in your field or it's in your wash pack, by the time you get it to your customer, think of the number of bacteria just by not coming in contact with anything else along the way that have grown and are on that produce or, or product. Viruses are small particles that multiply only in a host not in the environment or on the produce. Contamination most often linked to an ill worker handling uh, fresh produce. So this is the one that we can prevent best by not having ill workers, by washing our hands, by making sure we're following worker hygiene. It takes only a few virus particles to make someone ill. Not many at all. Um, it can be stable in the environment, so it can last for quite a while. And prevention is the key on this one particularly. There are limited options with viruses for effective sanitizers. Parasites are protozoa or intestinal worms that can multiply, only multiply in a host, animal or human. Um, they're commonly transmitted by water, can be very stable in the environment, often not killed by chemical sanitizers, can survive in the body for long periods of time before it ever causing them. So if we take a look at that can be stable in the environment and they're often not killed by chemical sanitizers. So, so you go, oh, well, you know, if they're there, they're there, what can we do about them? What you can do about them is prevent them from becoming, um, or from coming in contact with your product in the first place, okay? So prevention is kind of uh, key there. And um, I don't want to take too much time, but I actually have a, have a dear friend that was just diagnosed with Giardia. And he didn't come in contact with bad water. He was, he's a hunter though, and he was out in the fields, and somewhere where he was hunting, he you know in, inhaled soil um, that had it in the soil, and he was very ill for a long time. So it, it happens, even though we think maybe sometimes it only happens in third world countries, that's not the case. So the challenges. Fresh produce is often consumed raw. That's the, the number one challenge. People take it home, you're gonna eat your carrots raw, you're gonna eat your lettuce, you're not gonna cook that first. Melons, all of those, tomatoes, all of those good, wonderful things that we grow, we're gonna eat them raw. So there is no kill step. There's no heating um, to, to kill those microorganisms. Microbial contamination on produce is extremely difficult to remove once it's there. So again, going back to prevention is key. Think about uh, this can picture of a cantaloupe or the strawberry or even the lettuce. How many little crevices there are in the rind uh, or the, the outside of that cantaloupe or on that strawberry, all the little tiny places for microorganisms to exist. Um, so they're, they're very tough to get rid of once they're on there. And contamination is often sporadic. And we're gonna talk about how that sporadic contamination happens when we're looking at best practices. They can multiply on produce surfaces and in fruit wounds. You pick all your produce, it looks gorgeous, right? And you take it to the market, and you get to the market and some of those beautiful tomatoes somewhere between home and the market have gotten bruised, right? And those bruises are absolutely fabulous places um, along with some right conditions to cause some contamination. Humans are by far the biggest um, contaminator, the biggest way that contamination is spread. Workers spread pathogens uh, because they directly handle the produce with your hands. Um, improper health and hygiene practices are among the top. And a lot of times we think, oh, that's just out in California in the big fields where they hire migrant workers. No, you have to begin thinking of yourself as a worker and yourself as a worker on your farm. Um, <coughs> thinking about your health and your hygiene as you're uh, picking your product or making your product if you're, if you're canning things, jellies, jams. Lack of adequate training and hand washing practices and lack of or inadequate toilet facilities are among the top 
top uh, reasons why we are maybe not as hygienic as we should be. And then after that, illness or injury. I know it as a producer myself. You get up Tuesday morning and Tuesday is your harvest day and you feel like crap, right? You've got that cold coming on, but by gosh, it's got to get picked because the market is tomorrow. So what do you do? You go out and harvest it anyway. Really, we have to start rethinking that mindset and, and having a plan, having a backup plan. If I am ill, if I am not feeling well, if I fall under that de definition of being ill, who can I call on? Do I have friends? Do I have family? Do I have others that I can say, you know, I really shouldn't be picking produce right now? And if that's not possible, then what are some of the precautions you can take? Are you going to wear gloves? Are you going to wear a mask? You know, what are some of the precautions you can take to make sure that you are not spreading that um, to your products? Contamination is also spread by animals. Domesticated and wild animals can carry and transmit human pathogens to your produce. Um, field intrusion may result in direct fecal contamination. That's a nice way of saying the gophers are pooping in your field. Um, and there's, we'll talk about things we can and cannot do to prevent that later. Um, animal feeding, rooting, and movement through your fields may spread contamination. Animals can contaminate water sources, and that water is then some used to water your produce or comes onto your produce via runoff. And manure runoff can contaminate the fields and your water sources in the crops. And I have no idea what that red thing is. I don't know if that's Rudolph or I, I should change that because it bothers me every time it comes up. Okay, it's also spread by water. Water is the number two, you know, humans number one. Water is also a big contaminating factor. It can carry and spread the pathogens over a large, you think about you and your hands um, and picking produce, you may handle 100 tomatoes, but if you're watering your whole field with that water and the water is contaminated, <coughs> you've now contaminated them all. So production water in irrigation, um, we don't use it much for frost protection up here, although some people do. Um, Post-harvest water, we're washing our, our produce or our products after they've been picked. Um, again, we don't do a lot of waxing up here, but if we did, um, that might be a spot. And then unexpected events. You folks here, especially in the Red River Valley area, Minot area, you have seasonal flooding. It happens. <coughs> All of those uh, water issues are ways that can can contamination can be spread. Also soil amendment. Um, raw manure and other amendments can be a source of contamination, especially the manure piece, and we'll talk about compost later. Um, some of the things that aid in contamination are application too close to harvest. We'll talk about the right days. Improper or incomplete treatment. I was on a phone call yesterday with the other uh, Food Safety Modernization Act people in this region. Um, there's seven states. And we were talking about our food safety trainings. And when you do a full FISMA produce training, there's a, there's a little test that comes at the end. And they were talking about the questions people most often got incorrect on that test. And one of the questions was about compost. And <coughs> the one instructor spoke up and said, you know, they feel, he said, I haven't had a single person in one of my classes yet that understands that manure that's been sitting in a pile for 10 years, 15 years, is not compost. That that's still manure. That compost has to go through a process, and we'll talk about that process. So when we talk about improper or incomplete <coughs> treatment, that's you know manure that maybe has not gone through that whole scientific time and temperature control process. Improper storage, runoff, and wind spread. Those are the three that I like to bring out to my producers um, most often. Because many of us that do have livestock um, on our property and also produce, produce um, we have those piles of manure or, or bedding that's contaminated with manure. But we don't often think about, okay, the pile is there and when I take the trailer to, out to my produce field, I drive right past it or right through it or right over it, you know. So there are things um, that we don't think about when we store those animal products, byproducts, and uh, we may be 
contaminating our produce fields without even thinking about it. And then cross-contamination due to improper sanitation. We'll talk about this as well. Surfaces, equipment, tools, and buildings. Any unclean surface that contacts your produce can harbor pathogens and serve as a source. Um, and this is why having a, a practice or a procedure that you follow to ensure that your tools, your equipment, and your buildings are clean and safe to the best of your ability uh, is in your best interest. Facility, facility management impacts risks, and that includes areas outside uh, your building that are not kept mowed or clean, uh, where the little mice can hide. Um, standing water or debris that's present in the packing house often becomes a source of cross-contamination. My best example of that is we are um, a, a state inspected licensed processing facility. It sounds big, right? But it's not. Um, it just means that the state inspector comes out and looks at our wash pack facility and makes sure that we're following best practices, right? One of the things that I don't always agree with what I do is that garbage needs to be emptied every day. When you're done, you need to empty that garbage every day. Why? Because if it were to, that debris were to sit there, there's leaves in there, there's pieces of produce that maybe go on the floor, whatever, all in there, that can be a great place to harbor some of those pests and those microorganisms. So you want that out of there. Um, and, and that's something you might not think about if you weren't going through this process. Okay, first we want to make something really clear. Cleaning versus sanitizing. Cleaning is physical removal of the dirt. You're going to clean uh, your tabletops. You're going to clean your toes. And you're physically going to remove that, that dirt. Sanitizing is actually treatment to eliminate microorganisms using a sanitizer. And there's a difference. There's a difference between something that's clean and something that's sanitized. You cannot sanitize something that's dirty. It has to be cleaned first. Then you can sanitize it. So we want to make sure that we, we follow that procedure and get things clean, get the dirt washed off first, and then sanitize. All right, this is where we're going to start to spend just a little bit more time. And that's what regulations do you follow. I like to think of it as a large funnel. Up here, the FSMA, Food Safety Modernization Act, that is a federal regulation. That federal re regulation will probably not apply to any or maybe very few of you. And we'll talk about what those exemptions are, but it's really good for you to know about it. After that federal, then there's the state of North Dakota regulation that you will need to follow. Under that is, do you have any buyers that have specific regulations? Because no matter what I tell you today about, oh, you need to have this label, or you need to have that inspection, or you need to have that license, if you're selling to a grocery store, or you're selling wholesale, or you're selling to a restaurant, your customers may have specific guidelines. As an example, at Dakota College of Botno, I mentioned our demonstration facilities. Our demonstration facilities, because we're growing produce and, and testing varieties and testing techniques, what do we end up with as product? A lot of produce, right? That produce <coughs> is sold to the college dining facilities. Those college dining facilities um, are ran by Sodexo. Sodexo, as a company, has its own set of regulations that we need to follow. And they're not federal, they're not state, because we've already followed all of those. It's something very specific to Sodexo. So your, your customers and your buyers may also have certain guidelines that you need to follow on top of those. And then finally, you. What are your standards? What are your practices that, that you, the steps you want to take to minimize the risk on your farm or in your operation? So, the Food Safety Modernization Act, huge, it covers processing, it covers animal food, it covers, you know, all, all sorts of things. The piece that I am a trainer for and familiar with is the produce rule. 
all right? Um, the project <coughs> tool, because it also contains all those others, of course, just looks at the, the produce end. But all of those pieces are focused on prevention um, of food safety issues, and they encompass the entire food system. So the Food Safety Modernization Act, first, how do you know if it applies to you? So here's, here's how you decide if it applies to you. Do you grow, harvest, pack, or hold produce? Now the, the grow and harvest part, I think we can all, yeah, I grow it or yes, I harvest it. But you might ask, what is the pack or hold piece? Um, sometimes you may have several farmers or producers that are working together and they grow it on one farm and then after it's harvested, they hold it before it goes uh, to the customers on another farm. So maybe you don't grow anything on that farm at all, but you hold produce there, okay? Then you would have to say yes, all right? So if you do any of those things, then you've said yes to that. Now, is it for personal consumption? If you grow, harvest, pack, or hold, and it's only for you and your family, it's just personal consumption, you are not selling it, don't worry about it. But if you are selling it, we're gonna go to the next level, which is, is any of it consumed raw? Is any of the produce you grow consumed raw? Now, there are some things, um, how did that go? There's, they have a list. You know, if you're in doubt, the federal government has a list, right? Um, there are two things on there. What was it? Turnips are, relic, are, are consumed raw, but beets are not. That one, uh, you know. So the list is not always um, correct or, or always appropriate, but it gives you some, some general guidelines. Basically, though, if it's something that is consumed raw, you want to keep going to the next step. Does all of what you have have a kill step? So what's a kill step? I used to work with a producer up in the northeast part of the state that produced carrots. Every carrot he harvested was sold to a processing company. And in that process, of course, it was heated, it was cooked, it was changed, it was hydrated. Um, so that was the kill step, all right? This would also um, fall into, for us here in North Dakota, say I'm one of the aronia growers, and all of my aronia, all of them, go to Woodward Farm, and she cooks them into jelly. That is a process that has a kill step, okay? So the question is, does all of what I grow have a kill step? If not all of it has a kill step, we're going to this next criteria, which is, do you sell $25,000 or less annually of produce and sell it directly to consumers within 275 miles of you? Now, I know it would have been easiest to start with this one because that's kind of the cutoff for most people. It's like, yeah, I'm under $25,000, you know, um, so I don't, I don't need to worry about that. If you're under that $25,000, you are pretty much exempt. But you need to know these other pieces as well because it is my hope and I know that all of you are going to become extremely successful and local foods are going to grow and you're going to be making more than $25,000 a year. And then what? Okay? We'll retire. <laughs> we'll retire. We're all going on cruises, right? Yeah. Um, so, so you need to know the rest of these things as well, okay? Um, the, the personal consumption, the, the is it consumed raw, is it, um, is it going to some place that has a kill step? Well, like even the, um, like on that first one, the whole produce, if, if you're picking produce out of your garden and then putting it in your shop or whatever, overnight or for a day and a half before you go to the market, then you're holding it too. Absolutely. So. Yes, you are. Yep. So, and that's why it's written that way. It's, but, you, you know, as a federal guideline, you kind of have to um, write things in a way that, that fit most, or it is your hope that they somewhere will all fall within these. Yep. Yeah. 
So we've pretty much established that pretty much, is there anybody in here that is not exempt? If, if you're under 25,000, you've got to kill step, you're exempt. Are you, is everybody exempt here? Yes? Okay, everybody's exempt, we've pretty much established, but why should you care and why should you follow it? Because as I said, your business will hopefully grow and at some point you will be above that 25,000. Um, also, being exempt from FISMA does not protect you from liability. This is, if somebody gets sick, it doesn't matter that you're exempt, you can't, when they come knocking on your door and say, we've traced this cantaloupe back to you, you can't say, oh, but I'm exempt from FISMA. But no, liability and insurance and liability are separate from the food safety regulations. So I'll be sure you know that. No one wants to make their customers sick. You definitely don't want to do that. Also, farm food safety plans and use of good agricultural practices may open up new markets for you. We have a good agricultural practices plan for our farm. We're small, we're under that 25,000, we're exempt, okay? But our plan, because we have a plan, has opened up new markets for us. We were able to walk <coughs> into several grocery store chains and say, here's our good agricultural practices plan. This is what we do to make sure everything is safe. And it, they were really impressed by that and they count on that and they actually ask for it every year. Can you send us your updated plan? And so it really did open up some new markets for us. Also, regulations changed and you need to be prepared, not surprised. Two questions, even though a grower may be exempt, and I'm doing this, I'm asking some of these questions for other growers in our market. Right. If they maybe want to sell to another producer, I'm thinking of like selling to Travis for ingredients in his bread, or if you want to sell to 10 North Main, um, are they, I mean, they still are considered exempt, even if they fall under all those other guidelines. Number one. Okay, so, so there's two issues here. First, um, what you mentioned, there there will be a state regulation okay. that will come so into we'll play on that. Laws, yes, okay. we'll get the Lugati food laws on that. But from a federal perspective, um, you, you're selling within 275 miles, you're selling to someone else, um, they're under 25,000 from a federal exempt. perspective, okay. um, they are exempt from that, but I not. Said, from the state. The second question is maybe more to Jamie. Um, we talk about tracing back. I don't know how many times I've been asked over my 25 years in the market, I got such and such, I want some more of such and such that I bought from you. Well, maybe something I never produced. Our, our customers don't know where they bought it most of the time, mm -hmm. unless they're an absolute, this is the only guy I go to and I've ever gone to, you know, over the years. I mean, how many times has somebody said to you, I got some really good corn from you, or I got, you know, and they they honestly don't know. So how do you ever trace them? Yeah, we haven't had to be involved with any tracebacks okay. of local crops. The tracebacks that, that in my agency here that we've been involved with have always been things that have come on an invoice, okay. they've got a commercial label on them, they've got a commercial lot number, and with those, I mean, that's, that's fairly easy. If it ever did come down to we had to trace back a local product, good luck. Then good luck. Um, actually, the closest we had to come was uh, there's there's a food producer that we work with, and uh, they make their products uh, in a in a plant, and they're not produce, but they're they're a locally made product. And when they first started, you know, they were kind of on a learning curve and everything. So they produced a product, and it went out, and they got a call from somebody who said, oh, "I bought some of your product, and there was glass in it, and a uh, big big chunk of glass or whatever it might be." And so what ended up happening was the, the, the producer had to call every person that they'd sold to, you know, any time recently and recall all their product because they didn't have lot numbers or anything like that. And ended up recalling every single bit of it, taking every bit of it back and taking a huge loss. So that's the closest we've come to local products. You know, if, if I don't know, I mean, if it was, yeah, if it was like produce, for example, it could be tricky. I imagine, though, there would be more than just probably more than one person getting sick in a short period of time where... You know, it depends on what kind of organism we're talking about. I mean, sometimes it's, it, it could be an organism that makes a lot of people sick and it's a product that you think went a lot of places, but like, like Holly said, contamination isn't uniform. I mean, you know, you could have a product and all the contamination is in one lump, we'll say, in part of the product, and one or two people get sick and nobody else does. 
So I mean, it's very possible that it could be one person, two people, it could be hundreds. You know, it just depends on. Back when we had our commercial kitchen and we just sold to stores, we always did lot numbers and all that kind of stuff, kept all the records. Would you advise our local marketers now to put lot numbers on all their jellies, all that kind of stuff? I would. I would, and, and, and even if it's just from the perspective of if something happens, if for some reason one badge was found to be bad, if you have lot numbers, you know that, okay, I made only this stuff on this day, I can recall that. It's going to minimize you know, you, how much loss you're going to take. Well, you, you wouldn't know who you that. sold it to, but only those people would really be able to come back at you. For yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things, there, there are some, some simple tips and tricks that a small producer can do for record keeping for traceback. You just mentioned jams and jellies, right? If by batch, okay, um, you wouldn't even have to number it or whatever, a green sticker on the bottom of this batch, a red sticker, and you keep that record at home in your own little notebook. The green sticker went on the batch that was produced on July 27th, you know, with these ingredients. Then if there is an issue, you know, it's like, well, look on the bottom of, of the jar, what color sticker is on there? You know. Okay. When it comes to produce, and we've talked about produce as well, um, with, with us and, and what we do on our farm, our stuff goes into grocery stores, um, our harvest records, because we're keeping harvest records, you know, I know that I pulled six tubs of basil, they all came from the high tunnel, and then I follow the sales records to see where they went on this date, and I was the one that picked it. The next week, we picked three, and they came from row four in the field, and then I can follow the sales records to know where they went. I mean, even just something as simple harvest records will kind of tell you, so, so that you could go back if somebody came to you and said, oh, I want more of this product that I bought from you last week. You know, you can look at your records and say, I didn't have that at market last week, so it, it couldn't have been. Any other questions on that? Because now after, oh, one more thing I want to say about this one. Although you may be exempt, here's the example that I gave. <coughs> Although you may be exempt, as with many federal regulations, you have to be prepared and able to prove that you are exempt. So you need to keep records. And what record is that? The easiest one is your sales. If you're under 25,000 and you have a record of your sales, right there, you've got it. And the, the example I use with that is my mother. She's um, two weeks away from being 88 years old. She's 88, she lives on her, her social security and um, her, her other small income, right? She does not need to file taxes. But every year, and I just got this phone call from her on Sunday, every year she gathers her paperwork, her stuff from the bank, her stuff from her CD, her stuff from, from Social Security, and she, she says, Holly, come pick up the package so you can scan it to your sister so she can do my taxes. She has my sister run the taxes so she can prove that she didn't need to file taxes. Same way, okay, with this. Keep your sales records and keep them for the appropriate number of years. I recommend seven, you need at least three, okay? That's the easiest way to prove that you're exempt. So if there's ever a question. Oh, I have 25. Uh, you have 25? Oh my goodness. Can we have a big bonfire or something? Bonfire, yeah. Okay, so now we're going to move into the North Dakota Food Freedom Act. That was the federal. Remember our funnel? Now we're moving down to state. It passed in the last legislative session. It is still under the oversight of the North Dakota Department of Health. The final regulations and guidance are not yet in place. It is not free reign on homegrown foods. There will be a public comment period, watch for it. And hopefully, I, I am very optimistic that it will create some continuity statewide. Okay. So it hasn't gone through administrative rules yet? Exactly. Clara Sue is right on top of it. She knows. Just because something goes into law, the process when, when a new law is made is, now it's a law, yes, but how are we going to enforce that law? That's what's called administrative rules. And those administrative rules are not final yet. It takes, we're, we're go it's government, it takes time. Um, so what's happening is, the North Dakota Food Freedom Act passed. 
Then the State Department of Health formed a task force that, that has producers on it, it has people like me on it, it has some folks like Jamie on it, um, that are all kind of putting in our words for the draft of the guidance that will guide how this North Dakota Food Freedom Act <coughs> is enforced. That draft then goes to a committee and then it goes out to the public. <coughs> it, we have a conference call coming up in like a week to take a look at that draft. That's, that's where we're at. Monday? Monday. Monday. We have, we have a conference call Monday to look at that draft again. Then it will go to committee and then it will go out to the public to say, hey, public, what do you think of these guidance documents? That is your opportunity, and I highly encourage you to do so, to read it, think about it, how it will affect your operation, the producers you know and work with, um, and then write public comment. Because remember, that's the word draft. Yes, Jamie, please. And that's if you like it or if you dislike it, either one. They, you know, they want commentary either way. If you think that the rules are the greatest thing you've ever seen, send that in in your comments. You can go down to the live session and enter your comments into the record, and they don't put you in front of the legislature and grill you. They just allow you to enter in your comments, and they take that, and then everybody gets to look at it and, and use it in their evaluation of the rules. So, and if you need it, same thing. Go in there and say that this is, even better would be to go in there and say, I don't agree with this point, I don't agree with this point, I work with, you know, I work with growing produce, and this is not realistic. The, the, the more specific you can be, the more you can show why you disagree or why you agree, the better off it is, the more credence it has. Or a suggestion on what to change, yeah. to make it better, yeah. um, is also, um, yes, you can go testify at the legislature. <coughs> there will be a day when you can go, go do that in front of the committee. Um, but they will also take, you know, an email, a letter, uh, you know, probably not like a smoke signal, but hey, um, they'll, they'll take public comment in almost any form. Now, because it is public comment, all of the comments will be read. All of the comments will be taken into account. That's what happened with the Food Safety Modernization Act. They put the draft out, and they literally had more public comment for that um, new rule than any other they had put out in the previous five years. Because farmers and producers read it, looked at it, and said, no, I don't like this, or yes, I do like this. So where will this draft be posted at? Jamie, do you know the most common places? Well, you know, for the, the proposed guidelines right now, you can go to the North Dakota Department of Health website, and they've got a cottage foods page. And I believe the most and that's current in version your, is there. Um, yes, send an email when that probably comes when it comes out. So we because it's not in the century yet. code right now. Right? No. I mean, no, not even the draft. No, the century code piece is actually this is the cottage food law right here. Yes, yeah. and then a couple lines on the back. That's that's the law. That's what. That is, that is yeah, in the century code. This is in effect today, and it's uh, 2309.5. And that's the how the rules. law that just hasn't been, the rules haven't been written yet. It's right. Written. That's how the law is written and now they just read the rules. Now, yeah. um, pages 18 and 19 in your book, um, North Dakota Cottage Foods Resources, you can go to some of those resources and um, North Dakota Department of Health Cottage Foods page is listed on that resource page. Um, they'll be posted there. Is Devlin chairing the administrative rules or who's chairing this thing? That I don't know. I, I don't go for that committee, so I'm not sure. Okay, so um, before we go into the way the draft is currently written, which is what we're going to do today, we're going to go over how those the draft of the guidance document is written as of today. Understanding that that most probably will change somewhere but I want you to understand at least what's in it for now, all right? Um, I also want you to understand, like I say, like Claire Sue, thank you very much, brought up that the law's in place, but how they're going to enforce that is not, and that's what they're working on. And that your, your words, your comment, are very important when that comes over. Okay, so you, in your booklets, you have um, page four, uh, page five really should have been 
up farther, but page four is in there. That's your cottage food handout. We're going to go through these kind of one at a time. What is a cottage food operator? Cindy, you want to come up and help me with some of these? Please. So a cottage food operator is someone who sells directly to the consumer. Yep. We are not talking about someone who sells to a restaurant, a grocery store, a school, um, any other organization, group, or group of people. Okay? This is, you're the cottage food producer, I'm the consumer. Okay? In person, too. That's important. Yep. Not over the internet, not through the mail, in person. So what is an informed end consumer? Because that is part of the law. That won't change, correct? No, nope, that's in here. It's in the law. You must sell to an informed end consumer. What that means is you have to make sure that your customers that you're selling face-to-face -face with one-on-one -on -one, understand that you are producing your food in an uninspected, unlicensed facility. And that goes for whether it's a jar of jelly or um, to me, raw produce is, is okay, but they should still be doing it? No, you know, raw produce is exempted under a different law. If it's whole and raw and it's produce, you can sell it to the ultimate consumer and there's no regulation. Okay, so, but the key words in what he just said is whole, uncut. He didn't say uncut, I and raw. It, but whole, uncut, and raw. So don't worry about this, if all you sell is sweet corn and you sell it you know on the cob uncut uncooked don't worry about any of this right well you still got insurance and liability. exactly you <laughs> still have insurance and liability and you still want to make sure you keep your sales records so that you can prove you're under 25 thousand right well okay. you don't have to talk to me that's what but I you don't have to talk to okay. me about it okay um but the informed end consumer you know even if if all i was doing was produce I would still put the sign up because that's what's in the law is the way to inform your end consumer is to put up a sign, placard, or banner at your booth, say if you're at a farmer's market, and we have an example in here. Um, get to the right page. There it is. There it is. Um, like page 19, 20, page 20. This product is made in a home kitchen that is not inspected <coughs> by the state or local health department. <coughs> Even if I was doing whole, uncut, <coughs> produce, would I still do this at my farmer's market and do I intend to do this? Yes, because there are still um, some issues of allergens. Um, there are still um, some issues for liability. Right? Um, that I want to be able to say, I took every step I possibly could to ensure that my consumers were informed. So the sign needs to be up in our booth. Do we still have to put it on every jar? Under the law, shall display a sign at point of sale or place on the product. So either or. Yep. And it's written that way because not everybody's doing farmer's market. Some people are doing, you know, direct sale from their home, or I cannot count the number of uh, jelly for sale ads I've seen on Facebook lately. That's kind of spooky, though, because if I went to the farmer's market and bought somebody's jelly or something as a gift for somebody else and gave it to somebody else, and they got sick, and just, yeah, I'd stick it on the product myself. But. Exactly. You're protecting yourself just as much. Okay, um, page nine actually explains cottage foods. But when you get to page 11, that's an important one. Page 11 is the frequently asked questions document that the State Department of Health has put out about the currently written draft of the guidelines. All right. So what products can I sell? In this, they have kind of a list of products that you can sell. You want to talk about those products, Jamie? 
The ones from the proposed rules? Yes. Um, no, I mean, if you, if you have a question about something specific, I can certainly talk about it, but uh, my advice would be just to look at that list. I mean, there's a lot of different things on there. From working with producers, I know I get calls all the time about things that aren't on the list. Mm -hmm. And the best advice I can give someone is think about it. Is it time or temperature control sensitive? Okay. Is it something that is stable putting it in the pantry? You know, is it time, temperature, control sensitive? A, a good um, guide for finding out whether something is time or temperature control sensitive is think about the grocery stores. Where do the grocery stores put it? In the grocery store, is it in a cooler? In the grocery store, is it in a freezer? In the grocery store, is it sitting out on a shelf? Bananas are not refrigerated. They're not time and temperature control sensitive, right? Um, is that? that? That's one way to look at it. Something else to keep in mind is that if it's produced commercially, they might be employing processes that, uh, that you might not or that, that you don't have access to. So, I mean, just for an example, you can go to the grocery <coughs> store and there's chicken noodle soup in a can on the shelf, and that's safe. You can store it there all day long for years and years, and it's fine. But if you hot water bath can chicken noodle soup at your house, um, I would not put that on the shelf at room temperature and think that's going to be fine. You know, there's they have access to procedures and equipment and everything that you don't. So, just because it's on the shelf doesn't always necessarily mean that's safe. I mean, what she's what, what Holly referred to with TCS foods, um, that that's that's you know your best guideline if it, if it is TCS or not, and there's criteria for how to determine that. You know, in first district health unit. If, you, if you're in our seven counties and you have any questions about your product, whether you're going to do it cottage food or if you wanted to get a license, it doesn't matter. Call us here. I mean, you can call me. I'll uh, give it to anybody that wants it, my card, my phone number. Call me. I'll walk you through what I look for. We can talk about it. We have the capability here to do some testing with food. I mean, you can bring some in. We can test it and give you some information. I mean, that's, that's what we're here for. We'll give you every bit of help we can. Call, call and talk to me, and, and I'll answer whatever questions I can. So the, the, the basis of it, as we said, remember, whole, uncut, raw produce, don't worry, all right? So that's except for something else. But on page 12, baked goods, and there is there are some caveats for baked goods, because there are such things as cream pies and cookies and um, cheesecake. But, cheesecake. Candy is OK. Um, coated and uncoated nuts. Are fine. Home canned jams, jellies, preserves, including apples, cherries, grapes, plums, peaches, strawberries, and other berries. Chutney containing fruit as the main ingredient. Fruit butter, fruit pies, and fruit empanadas. Dehydrated fruits and vegetables, including dry edible beans, um, popcorn and popcorn balls. Cereal, including granola, flour, honey, dried herb season seasonings, and herb mixes. Vinegar, cider vinegar, and flavored vinegar, roasted coffee and dry tea, and farm flock eggs, which also have some, some additional um, requirement regulations. Um, all of those things are, are okay. So, pickled vegetables, dill or sweet pickles, salsa tomatoes, all of those other acidified foods need to have a pH of 4.6 or less. And we're gonna we're gonna go through that, and we're actually gonna. <coughs> We're going to test one of mine. <laughs> it doesn't pass. I, I, I don't sell that, so I'm OK. Um, but yeah. And naturally fermented foods such as sauerkraut and kimchi, again, where the pH level has been reduced to 4.6 or less. All of those are OK. They're all fine and dandy. Some of the things that are not OK. We talked about the time temperature controls. Um, garlic and oil and other flavored oils. Not okay. Pesto, not okay. Hummus, freezer jams, not okay. Focaccia style or flatbread with vegetables, meat, fish, seafoods, or cheese, not okay. Why is that? But the other brands are. You know, the stuff with the meats and well, that, cheese. Well, I'm, talking, I'm that's, talking vegetables or herbs. I mean. Yeah, because once you uh, cook those things, um, raw, uncut fruits and vegetables are, are raw, um, yeah, raw cut. They're not TCS, the, the time temperature control for safety, but as soon as you cook them, they become time temperature control for safety. The herbs are still okay. So I'm just, just thinking of the gal that used to make the conch in her 
years ago. Um, and I have a question for you, Jamie, on this particular one. It says focaccia style or flat bread with those things in. Other breads, like say I'm making a sourdough bread that has cheese in it? Right now, it sticks exactly what the rule says. I okay. wouldn't, uh, I'm not going to interpret it in any way. That's that's what's in the rule. That jalapeno cheddar is a hot item. I yeah. know. That's, Farmer's market, yeah. That's why I ask, because I know several bakers that sell like a sourdough or, or you know, that have a cheese in it. But it's not. Can you define focaccia style? I'm not familiar with baking enough. I've had focaccia style, but I, had, but I couldn't but define it. Yeah. No, I can't. I, I can't. Okay, <laughs> yay, baby. I'm glad there's somebody that can. It's like pizza dough with just toppings on yeah. the top and maybe some olive oil. oil. Okay, and so it's, baked. it's not baked into the bread. It's on yes, top. It, it, oh. No, it's ba it's on top and baked. Okay. And then baked. But it's not, should, should but it's not stirred into the dough. It's no. not like mixed into the actual dough. No, no. It's, it's, sprinkled on. it's on the top. But is focaccia style a different type of rising the dough or something that makes it, or, or a different ingredient in it? It's almost like a pizza dough, basically. Yeah. Okay. I don't see why that would, yeah. Yeah, that's basically it. I think. But it's, it's not an egg or nothing. No. no, no eggs in it. Okay. But I think you could run into it. I mean, this is just a guess, because again, that I don't know. but. Uh, if you have it on the top and it's not incorporated into the dough, there might be some risk of there being enough moisture left in it for it to stay TCS. Because that's that's another thing is the amount of water activity that something has, which is how much moisture is in there that the bacteria can use to grow. Um, if you take enough water out of some, something like meat, you're gonna make it so it's not even really a TCS food anymore. So maybe when it's on top, it's just right there and it doesn't get dried out enough. But when you mix it in, through the baking process, you know, the dough itself is going to pull some of the moisture out so that the final product just has a water activity that's low enough that it can't grow back to I mean, that's, that's a guess. For in this regulation, then, is a veg is herbs considered a vegetable? Um, under the, the cottage food rules? Well, for right here, for it may not be produced under this law. I mean, right, you've got the fascia style flat bread. Okay. I mean, is an herb going to, it says, can't do it if it's got vegetables. Are the herbs considered vegetable? I don't know for, for the cottage the bread, food rule. Cottage, cottage food rule, I'm not 100% sure. That's not my regulation. I know that if you look at the normal food code for the facilities that we regulate, um, when they talk about leafy greens, um, herbs are specifically excluded from cut leafy greens. So herbs wouldn't be included in that category. So focaccia with herbs only is okay. I, I, you know, under the food code it would be, as far as if you were interpreting it that way. But uh, the cottage food rule, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't speak to that right now. That's a good now. one for public comment. Yes. It's a great one for public comment. To clarify, yes. But, and actually they clarify. are going to be next time on March 12th and 13th, but I couldn't pull up the agenda to see if cottage law is on the agenda yet. Okay. Peggy. Uh, I know oftentimes with the focaccia, they'll put like Parmesan cheese on the top though yeah. too. Yeah, that would be a no-no. No, that would be a Except the stuff in the little green jar is shelf stable. It technically is, but it's also, I mean, it's, it's cheese, so I, I would adhere to exactly the words that are in there. It, it is shelf stable until it's open. Until it's open. Then once it's open, it is to be refrigerated. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, can I ask about something else? Of course. Dried vegetables. Uh, people, uh, are they safe, you know, people who cut and dry their vegetables and sell? Right on the approved list of Am hydrated I, fruits oh, and vegetables. Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. I was uh, Page uh, 12. There you go. I'm sorry. In big letters, it's page 2 of 7. Oh, but and even if they're cut, if you they've know, been like some dehydrated, people, to dehydrate yeah. them, you have to cut, cut them. them. But much. you've taken, as Jamie was talking about, the moisture content to a level where it no longer supports okay. microbial activity. Okay. Thank you. So freeze dried would be the same as dehydrated, I would say. Hmm. I don't know. I'd have to look at that process a little bit more. I'm not, uh, I'm not familiar with the, the mechanism of freeze drying, how you get to the final product. You know, ultimately, <coughs> the water activity is below what it would be for dehydration. I don't see it being any different. Yeah. It's just quicker than dehydration, and okay. it's for actually longer storage than dehydration. Yeah, because the goal is just to get to that level of moisture that's below the threshold of where bacteria can grow. As long as you're making a distinction between frozen 
and freeze dry. Right. right. Because like freezer jams, no, not allowed. No, no. Um, and I couldn't just like freeze up a whole bunch of basil and take it in. That's not allowed. But freeze dry is is a different process. Yes. This is why I'm glad you're here. <laughs> See, I knew they were going to ask me questions that I couldn't answer either. Um, so as you can see, there is still a lot kind of to be worked out, and I'm glad you're bringing these questions forward because these are the types of questions I get weekly. You know, it, this is a product. Is it allowed or not? Oh, I don't know the freeze drying process, right? Yep. Um, you know, it takes the right people working together to sometimes come up with an answer. But I wanted you to be very familiar with what's in the guidance now because you bringing forth these questions when Jamie and I, you know, are on the conference call on Monday and we're talking about the guidance documents. Guess what? Saturday we have this workshop and somebody asked about freeze dry. Freeze dry. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. We have a freeze dry. Not everything freeze dry as well either okay. for long term. So we're experimenting with it. Actually, the last one on page 13 is something Jamie and I talked about this morning. Meat products are not covered by this law. You want to read that part? I'm going to read that part. Yeah, okay. Because uh, I found that to be an interesting part, and it's, and it's important. Uh, this is from the law. Transactions <laughs> under this section may not include the sale of uninspected products made from meat, except for as provided below, and the below part talks about uh, poultry. There's some exemptions with if you produce less than a certain number of poultry, that's excluded, and you can do that and everything. But uh, for any cottage food that you're going to make, it it if it contains meat, it can't be sold in an uninspected format, which would be the cottage food format. So, no meats. Would it be possible to get a copy of that bill? Sure, I can make a copy today. And this, I just a little bit ago, I went to the Department of Health's website where it talks about the cottage food law, and it's got the guidelines, the proposed guidelines, and there's a link right there to go there. Oh, there oh. Yep, and it takes you right to this. If you type in ND Century Code cottage food law, it takes you right to this. So that means that no matter what the guidance documents come out with or what they explicitly say or do not say, according to the law, you can up soup or spaghetti sauce. You can't put meat in there unless you are an inspected, approved, certified kitchen. Now, I, I always want to put that unless on there because you know, I, I don't want to tell anybody you can't make and sell this. You can pretty much make and sell anything your little heart desires as long as you follow the right regulations, get the right licenses and, and inspections, okay? So under this, Cottage Foods, you're selling direct to the consumer, right? One-on-one, -on -one, face to face, no meat, except the poultry. Okay, but, but no, no beef, <coughs> none of those, okay? So that's kind of the, the products um, and the poultry products exemption is listed in there as well. Other things you can't sell, pickled eggs, pickled fish, pickled meats, pickled seafood, pickled eggs, I've seen them at the farmer's markets. Under this guidance document, as of right now, not allowed. Fish, smoked fish or shellfish products, milk or dairy products, butter, no compound butters, no herb butters, um, hard or soft cheeses, cottage cheese, yogurt, um, that again require temperature control for safety. Cut fresh fruits or vegetables or food products made with cut fresh fruits or vegetables that are not home canned, home processed or acidified. I have a million watermelon and cantaloupe and I've got raspberries and I'm going to put them all together. I'm going to cut up the cantaloupe and the melon and I'm going to put them with some raspberries and I'm going to make the most beautiful fruit coupés to sell at the farmer's market. No. Not a lot. Okay. Um, food products made with cooked vegetable products including potato salad, broths, soups. Fresh fruit dipped in candy or chocolate. So remember the candy was okay, but once you combine that dip, that chocolate, that coating with the fruit, not okay. Um, juices made from fresh fruits or vegetables, <coughs> okay. Now 
again, we want to be really careful in saying this because I know there are people out there that do this. They sell fresh squeeze, squeeze lemonade or you know fresh whatever juice. All right, they juice things. It's okay if you're doing it in a, an inspected facility, right? You have the proper licensing, you have the proper inspection. But just as a cottage food producer, then according to the guidelines as of today, that's not okay. Ice or ice products, uh, flavored water, unless from a verified potable water source. Talk about that one, please. Okay. Um, just the potable water in general, are you talking? Kind of, yeah. Ice okay. or ice products, flavored water. You know, the potable flavored water, water is getting to be kind of popular. People want to do that at the market. Yeah, the potable water would have to be from a source where it's tested. And so like if you were going to use, well, if we're here, City of Minot tap water, for example, that would be considered potable water. And you know that you could use for washing your stuff or doing whatever. But uh, if you have a private well, it wouldn't be considered potable water unless you had tested it and verified that there was no bacteria in there. So that would be something you want to keep in mind. You know, and then things like groundwater, not potable water, river water, lake water, you know, whatever, melted snow, not potable water. So um, the way I'm reading this, just to clarify, it says, unless from a verified potable water source, if someone, say, was here in Minot and they wanted to do raspberry flavored water because they have raspberries, they could do that if they were on Minot water. If they had used Minot water, that would be a verified or potable water source. If they had a well and they had their well tested, my suggestion would be, if you're going to do that sort of thing, take your test results with you. Keep them in your little cash box at the farmer's market or your, your stand. Have your test results with you so that if anyone asks, you can say, well, yes, as a matter of fact, look here. Here's my water test results. And do the test. Have it tested. And have it tested at a, a verified lab, like a legitimate real lab. In North Dakota, there's several that are certified by the State Department of Health to test drinking water. And uh, that's where you want it. So if you take a sample of your water and you carry it around for a couple weeks and then you finally get by a place that says their lab and you give it to them and they're like, yep, it's fine. They, that's not fine because they didn't know what they were doing. You know, water samples have to be analyzed within 30 hours of when they come out of the tap. There's some other very specific requirements. So just pick a certified lab, make sure that they are actually approved to do that kind of testing. What about just bringing it to you guys? Our lab is a certified lab and you could certainly use ours. Um, you know. they did ours. Oh. Yeah, they do mine, too. Yeah. Yeah. Mine's yeah. Well, you know, Tuesdays and Wednesdays only. If, if you <laughs> want to test your water, I mean, we have the sample bottles here. You can call. We can mail them out to you. I brought a couple extra in here just in case anybody wanted one. You could take one with you. Um, That's the one thing, though. They, they have the little kits. Um, well, yes, when you want your water tested, you have to have it back to the lab within a certain number of hours. The kits are good for longer than that. Oh, yeah, the kits, they stay good for a long as time. As long as they stay yeah. sealed and you keep their little yeah. protective right. seal on them. Yeah. So once you open it and put water in there, the box starts ticking. <laughs> the baked goods part on uh, page 14, there's a whole series of um, additional requirements and guidelines for those. The ones, and we'll talk a little bit about labeling, but safe handling instructions are required on all baked goods that require refrigeration. So if it needs to be required or refrigerated. Um, products must remain frozen. It's written right there for you how you want to word that on your, on your baked goods that need to be refrigerated. The one thing that got me, um, Jamie mentioned, you know, something that kind of surprised him in the way the law was written or the guidelines were written. The one that kind of got me was pumpkin pies. Pumpkin pies, I would have, if I had just read this, went, oh, pumpkin pie, that's a fruit pie, and it's okay. Pumpkin pies, no, because you also mix things like eggs with them, or cream, or dairy products with them. They need to be sold uh, frozen. And that's that's actually frozen. in the law. That's. I mean, it's in the guidance, and it'll be part of the rules that we specified in there, but that was adopted into the law itself. So right now, today, regardless of what the rules end up being, if it's uh, one of those products, it has to have the safe handling instructions, and you have to transport it frozen, and you have to sell it frozen. That's interesting. I mean, you can use eggs in other baked goods, but not from the pie and be considered okay. You know, it's because the final product is like a custard type product, and that's where, yeah. Can we go back? Still baked, but no. Yes. Horseradish is, okay. a, is a no-no. We've had people in the past sell horseradish. If they added enough vinegar to make the pH okay, then it's an okay product. 
Under the cottage food rule, um, I guess under the current rules, is there anything that specifically talks about pH with horseradish? Um, well, not does, with horseradish, but it does talk about it yeah. with, with um, sauces. Yeah. Right there. Oh, does it? Right there. Right there. Right there. Right there. Right there. That first paragraph. Um, which, which page? On um, um, 13 it says any oh. non-acidified um, um, food. Um, it says unless it has a pH of... Yeah, so you could do horseradish, Rajos, asparagus, beets, broccoli, Brussels sprouts. If you have, the, if you have enough vinegar to get the pH down, boiling water bath. So is that specifically referring to like vegetables? Because it looks like in this particular one, they're they're referencing a bunch of different vegetables. vegetables. And the horseradish is in there. But it's got vegetable yeah. soups there too. Yeah. 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 So if, if you so could verify that you got it below four point six, I believe you would be okay. I don't know if we'll ever have anybody do it again, but but it's it happens. That's, that's kind of a popular thing. So it, that 4.6 is the important piece. It's the magic number. It's the magic number. It's the magic number. Okay, um, whole uh, fruits and vegetables, we talked about that. They are exempt, don't worry about them. What are requirements for selling farm flock eggs? I know we have some egg folks here. All eggs being offered for sale must be candled. Uh, eggs are washed either manually or with the aid of an automatic uh, washer. The temperature of eggs held or offered for sale must be stored in refrigerated compartments at 45 degrees or lower. Cartons uh, used must be identified with the producer's name and address. Safe handling instructions um, should be listed on there as well. So if you're selling your eggs, this is the way the document is written as of today. And that's, so that's how it is right there? For the eggs? Nope, under the current law in North Dakota with eggs, if you have a small flock and you sell them directly to the ultimate consumer, then you sell them to the ultimate consumer. And that's that's all it says. I believe the, the version of the law that I read at one point in time was the one from the 20s or 30s or when it was first adopted, and it said something to the effect that the government shouldn't interfere with egg sales or, or hinder them. And so there was, you know, if it's small flock to the consumer, no, no requirements like that. Um, the cottage food law, that if it's on the rules page, once that gets adopted as rules, then those would come into play. So you know, right now a, you don't have to do some of these yeah. things. Right, right. But if these go into effect, that's why it's important. To and the Department of Ag has an egg inspection program. They I do. think it's ten dollars a year, and you get in their program. And there's a couple specific things that you have to do, and then your eggs are considered proof source which means you can sell them at grocery stores. You can sell them anywhere you want. So that's an option. And it, it, it's usually the types of things like what we're talking about in this law right here. And we just uh, spoke with an egg producer this last weekend here in Minot. We had just gone through that process. And she said it was very easy. The, the inspector was, was very helpful. He showed her how to properly candle. You know, he, she had missed some things when she was showing him how she candled. And, and he pointed them out to her. He, she said, I learned a lot through that process and she said it was painless and, and they were very helpful so nothing to be afraid of. Uh, poultry products under a thousand poultry, whole frozen poultry products slaughtered by the producer on the farm where poultry is raised if no more than 1,000 poultry are slaughtered per calendar year. The change that comes into play here um, from what it used to be is this now says poultry it used to just say chickens. So now you need to add in your, your ducks and your geese and your yep. quail and your pheasant and your all those other things. It just basically said, although it's pheasant, if it's domestically raised, it would be poultry. Yeah. It would be poultry. Okay, just making sure that would yeah. be still considered wild game if they were raising it. You know, if you got them from some source and selling pheasant eggs and everything right. like that, then it's poultry. Yeah. Okay, making sure. All right. Let's move on to the important, oh, we talked about what can't I sell, how can I sell? Before the law was passed, this was one that was being kicked around too. The important part of this is that exchange of product for money needs to take place face to face. Can you advertise it on Facebook? Yes, you can. Can you advertise it on your website? Yes, you can. Can I sell it? on my website now i think you can even take orders you can take orders that's just what i was going to say is when does the sale and how does the sale happen and that's the important part with the cottage foods it's 
I made it or grew it or produced it, and I'm taking Jamie's money. That's the sale. That's when the sale happens. It's when that exchange of goods or money takes place. And that needs to be face-to-face -face producer to consumer. Why? Because that is what aids and assists in ensuring that you have an informed end consumer. If I'm buying it from you and I have to see you to, to, to get my product, that allows me the opportunity to ask and say, hey, how do you raise this? How do you grow this? How do you make this? Were you eating peanuts in your kitchen when you made my whatever jam? Because I have a software for you to use. Okay? Um, that, that allows for that exchange. So under the Cottage Foods rule, yes, you can, you can take orders on your website, you can put it up on Facebook, you can, but as long as the final transaction, product for money, takes place face to face. Am I on point there? Yep, yep. The, the intent is that you have a consumer that can look at where you're making, because it's supposed to be face to face at your home or in you know, a farmer's market, that they can look at what you're doing and they can make their own decision if they think you're safe or not. So the, the theory is that they take on some of the burden of the liability. If you give them something that's not safe, well, they were there, they had the chance to look, they should have known that it wasn't safe by looking. So now, that's the theory. What I have seen already going on is on Facebook, uh, Grandma Rose puts up there that, that she's making strawberry pies and um, you know anybody that wants one can buy one for $6 and she's sending them to town with her brother's sister's cousin on Thursday. No. Grandma Rose isn't there to answer the questions. People aren't purchasing it from the brother's sister's cousin. They want to purchase it from Grandma Rose. And so you need to have that face-to-face -face interaction. Send it with somebody else unless that person is a, a, within your household family member or part of your farming operation. Correct? Yeah. Okay. And you're selling it to the consumer. Yeah. Can't sell wedding cakes under the cottage right. food law That's because you're not selling it to the consumer. It's going to go someplace else and those people are going to eat it and they didn't have the chance to look at your operation or make a determination if they feel it's safe or not. So catering is no and wedding you know, cakes, wedding cakes no. are wedding no. Wedding cupcakes, no. Yeah. But you can, be, you can be licensed and inspected. To sell that stuff, exactly. right? Exactly. Oh, okay. that's, that's what I kept saying. Okay. Is yeah. you can Under, pretty much make it. <laughs> Under turn and inspection, yeah. you can do a lot of things. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So licensing and inspection is, is not a bad deal. It may allow you a, a bigger uh, customer base. It may allow you to get your product to more people. Um, you just need to take that step. And we want to be very clear what a cottage foods producer is in comparison to somebody who's licensed which that's not all that difficult sometimes. So you couldn't advertise your jellies or nothing as gift packs then either. <laughs> Ooh, you yeah. know what, I, I wouldn't, no, because wouldn't. if you're doing that, then you're not selling it to, it's not going to the, well, see, here's it, you're selling it to somebody, but it's not going to the ultimate consumer. So that's where that's where a lawyer would come into play on that, and that's not me. I don't have anything to say. What you can do is you can have your gift boxes on your table, and they can pack your boxes right there. The other thing that I would do to protect myself is if I was making jams or jellies or even breads, I would not just have the the Sorry. banner and the sign that said "produced in a home kitchen." That little sucker sticker would be on every single product that could walk away mm -hmm. and be eaten over a longer period of time by anybody, yeah. exactly. I understand, you're not gonna put that sticker on every green pepper, <laughs> or every ear of corn, but something that, that isn't eaten in one sitting, as far as I'm concerned, anything that's not eaten in one sitting and, and can stay in a fridge or, or a counter, I'd be putting that sticker on. Even, you know, I, I do herbs, and if we decide to go into dried herbs, now that I see they're okay, I'm gonna have that sticker <coughs> on all of them. Yes. Well, you know, in, in North Dakota, we have strict liability. And if you do something that hurts somebody else, you're responsible. It doesn't matter, you know, if you haven't had a waiver, you're still responsible. You know, it doesn't matter if it's somebody else's fault. If it was something that you did or they came from you, you're responsible. <coughs> so with, with cottage foods, putting the label on there and everything, I mean, the, the idea is that you take some of that liability and you transfer it to the customer. 
I, I don't know, and you know that would be a court type thing, but with strict liability, if you make food and somebody gets sick, you're responsible because you made the food. And then, you know. Although you can't control how it's handled after it left your table. Right. That's true, but you would have to make the, you, the you'd have to be able to prove yeah. that they did something to mishandle it. It's, it's tough. It's, it is. That's why I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> hey. Now, let's say you're licensed and inspected by First District Council. But I decide to make jams and jellies. I'm only in, licensed and inspected by you uh, Produce growing. for the produce growing. I'm not for the jams and jellies, nope. right? Nope. So uh, I would want to use them also. Okay. And even um, would I have to go through something else to be licensed and inspected to do that. That would be a yep, that'd be a whole separate category. Whole separate if, category. If you yeah. were selling to someone other than the end consumer, if you're just taking your jams and jellies to the farmers, farmers market, market. Yeah. yeah. Label them appropriately yeah. and, and you're good. But if you're gonna sell them to the grocery stores that you sell to yeah. or someone else, then yes you can. Yeah. So the importance of this is because we go to the farmers market and, and I know the cottage foods Law also covers CSAs, on-farm sales, farm stands, all of those other good things. But it seems like the majority of folks are, are kind of selling to farmer's markets. And we go to the farmer's market and this is what we see, right? Look at those pretty jars of jams and jellies and all of the, the produce is neatly washed and in tubs and it's labeled and everything. Um, and as a customer, as a consumer, I walk up and I go, wow, look at these clean cucumbers and you know, these folks really are doing it you know quite right but what you don't see as a consumer is this and this is how maybe some of those jams and jellies were made where, where the cat is walking across the counter she's, she's having a smoke while she's you know making your jams and jellies and there's some dirty dishes though if you're here in the sink and some raw chicken with some flies on it and you know we don't see that we don't see that and I can honestly tell you this has happened to me. <laughs> I went to visit a producer and I was, I was extremely shocked because I had shopped at their farmer's market stand quite often and thought how beautiful their stuff looked. Their place must be awesome. And then I got to their place. This is not them, what I'm just saying. <laughs> I have a question back on page 16. Yeah. It says the following information is recommended. And that includes your list of ingredients. I thought that was required. It's just recommended. Just recommended. I don't believe that it the is list not of required. Is in the law. No. But you told us last time we were off to our market that it was required. <laughs> Before the the North Dakota cottage food law went into effect, um, cottage food was kind of a. It, it was more. It was across the state. Different jurisdictions regulated in different things. Um, in First District Health Unit, we had requirements in our code where. Um, you know, if you do these things, you're licensed inspected. But if you want to do, but we're into all intents and purposes, cottage foods, the things from the guidance document, um, you can do that. We don't license you then, but there are some things you have to do just to make sure everything is okay. And, you know, they included the statement about being made in the home kitchen. And in ours, we did have the ingredients as well. So you had that list of ingredients on there and the contact information where, you know, this, like, you know, JD can this jam at his house, and here's thing. his phone number. Yes. And so that was, that was regulation here. But once this went into okay. effect, there are regulations, we, uh, they were invalidated, and now that's not the case, so. So going back to when we started, and I said, even though you know the, the regulations for cottage foods may change, and they're kind of in flux right now, bottom line, what's one of the things that we know we're gonna come out of it with is some consistency, you know, because that's a good example of where, okay, that, that changed for your first district. Because as you can see, we have a lot of different health districts in the state, and you know, if you're like me, and you live, see that little crook on Benson County? Like, that's where I am, okay? And we sell our products in Minot, Grand Forks, Jamestown, Fargo, Grafton, um, Minnesota, East Grand Forks, Crookston. You know, I'm in four or five different health districts right there. This. Although I'm talking about my products that go to the grocery stores and that's wholesale and that's a whole other thing. If I had been hitting farmers markets in all those locations, it would have been a lot of different rules. And the farmers markets 
regulations will at least be a bit more consistent. So I'm going to let um, Jamie, if you go to, Jamie has like two or three slides, and then we're going to take a break. I've just got some really basic information. If you're in these counties, I said you are in the first district health unit, we're the local public health unit, and we provide a lot of different services. And uh, the division that I am in, the environmental health division, we work with food safety. So if you have questions about food safety, you can always call. And again, if you want to do cottage foods and you have questions, call me. I'll talk to you about them. That's uh, you know, I love talking about food safety. Um, if you wanted to get a license, you know, you could call me, and we could talk about that too. Um, we do not regulate raw, whole fruits and vegetables. We do not regulate eggs from a small flock producer. We don't regulate honey. We don't regulate cottage foods. If you do any other food in First District Health Unit. The odds are good that we work with it in some way, and the odds are really good that we probably regulate it in some way, so it might involve licensure and inspection. So if you're not doing one of those specific things, but you're doing something else, uh, let me know and we can talk about it. I, and, you know, and I didn't put meat on there because meat is Department of Ag and poultry and everything. So if you do anything with raw meat and, and you want to sell it or do anything, you're always under Department of Ag. Um, we, uh, like I said, regulate everything else. And uh, you know the regulations aren't as bad as some people think sometimes, and the requirements aren't as bad as some people think. So if you have a question, call and we'll talk about it. We you know, we'd love to talk to you about what's going on. Um, one of the things that we do work with, we work with people that grow produce and sell it to facilities that we license. Um, in the food code, it says that all your ingredients have to come from an approved source. Now the food code is the book that applies to licensed establishments. So you know you sell at the farmers market, the consumer comes up. They can buy from whoever or whatever. But if you want to sell to, somebody said 10 North Main earlier, if you want to sell to 10 North Main, you can sell to them, but they can't use anything that doesn't come from an approved source. So when they're regulated by us, by our inspector, if I was in there and I found something and where'd you get this, so I bought it from Bob, they can't use it. They would have to get rid of it, they have to destroy it because they can only have things from an approved source. So if you want to grow that produce and you want to have it be an approved source, uh, give me a call. We have a program where you can work in it where there's some requirements. Um, you have to have a farm plan. You have to have good agricultural practices and some things that you have to do. And then you are an approved source to where if, if they were to get produce from you and we were to find it there, they could actually use it. Oh, license fee is $30 a year for uh, being a produce grower. Um, if you do cottage foods, uh, we just went through all the things that you can do and how you're exempted, but if you wanted to do something else or if you wanted to go from being a cottage food producer to selling it in grocery stores or someplace like that, um, that would require a license and it would require an inspection. And if you want to do that, again, talk to somebody from here. You know, talk, talk to one of us and we'll walk you through what, uh, what you need to have. A lot of times we'll ask specifically what you're doing and we'll walk through the steps and tell you you know what you're doing is is uh, this or that or whatever you give you give you every bit of information that we can uh, could save you a huge amount of time and money um, if you were thinking about doing it call us first don't build a facility and then call us because there's requirements for all facilities and if you don't put a hand sink in there and you've got a poor concrete slab well now you're in trouble because you have to have sinks and you have to have, have certain places and uh, you might have to jack every floor and there's all kinds of stuff so and you guys for us when we did it you came out three different times Rain, we met with you with the floor plan. Yep. You came out during construction before you closed things in. Yep. And then you came out when we were done. Yep. And then we had the FDA after that. But yeah. They worked with us really well. So you'd raise your hand earlier. Did you have a, a comment or a question? So um I think it's important to talk to chefs and restaurant owners that they're not allowed to purchase from the farmers market. That's because true. I find we tell them that, and yeah. they understand that they're not supposed to, but they, they do. They do. And, and if they do, I mean, I'm not in there 365 days a year. If it's a facility that I go to, we inspect it, uh, say, twice a year. And, but, you know, if I'm in there and I find something, I'm going to ask where it came from, ask for an invoice. If they can't prove it, uh, you know, we'll throw it in the garbage. And we'll pour some bleach on it, and it's gone. But, uh, it, you know, if I'm not in there, they might. But the theory is that everything has come from a proof source. And legally, that's what they're supposed to do. And I guess ultimately, if we had a problem with it, they could face some ramifications. So. One of the things that I would encourage, because I know some of you are market managers or deal with other farmers, market vendors, that I would encourage those uh, producers to do that are interested in selling to these. Yes, get licensed, okay. But take a copy of your license, bring it to the market, and post it right under that cottage food sign. 
because that just helps. Mm -hmm. uh, th those restaurant owners, they know they're not supposed to be shopping there, but you know what? If I've got tomatoes here, and I've got tomatoes here, and these people have their producer's license displayed, you know what's gonna go through my mind as a restaurant owner is, wow, okay, that's an approved source, I'm gonna buy these. But it's then they should give you an invoice too as a, as a buyer. You should. And you because know. Jamie's gonna require it when he goes in. Yep. Up until recently, I worked with all the produce growers that we had in First District Health Unit. And so like if I was someplace and I found produce, I'm like, where did you get this? And they, well, I got it from Peggy. Well, you know, I know that she's an approved producer and so they didn't have an invoice. Well, I'm, you know, okay, I know that she's approved and everything and you know, okay. we trust people until we have a reason not to. Um, now we have different, we have new inspectors and we have people in different places and everything. And yeah, they might not know who's out there, and so the, an invoice might be a good way to go. So. And I used to just take one of them little, you know, carbon things with me. It wasn't very often that somebody asked me for an invoice or needed one, but it happened. And you know, you toss one of those in your cash drawer when you need it, you've got it. <coughs> oh, um, so with going from cottage food to being an actual licensed establishment. Just a couple of general things. I mean, there's there's a whole food code full of requirements, but some very general things. Number one, we do not ever, under any circumstance, license private kitchens. And the reason that that can ever happen, doesn't ever happen, was a picture that Holly put up there earlier. We don't know what goes on in your private kitchen. You know, anything could be happening there. So if you do wish to become licensed, it's not gonna be your home kitchen. We have facilities that will build a separate kitchen in their home where they've already got one, and it's got floor to ceiling walls, it's got solid self-closing doors, and the business happens in there and nothing else does, and that we will license. I mean, we can certainly work with you on that. I have people that I work with that have um, separate buildings right on their property where that's the commercial part of the facility. Other places will have an actual commercial operation someplace, and all those are fine, but uh, we unfortunately just cannot license your private kitchen because it just doesn't fall under any of our criteria for what we look for, what we require. Um, some foods and processes cannot be licensed or regulated by the First District Health Unit. If you want to can non-acidified foods, like you wanted to can chicken noodle soup, I, our agency can't license you and inspect you on that. That has to come from the FDA. The FDA works with non-acidified canning processes and retorting it, it's, is what it is. It doesn't fall under us. We don't have the expertise or the equipment to even work with you on that, so I can't, just, I can't work with you. Call me, I want to do some soup. Well, I have to get hold of the FDA and work with um, If you do get a license from us, one of our requirements is you have to take and pass our food safety class. Um, food safety for food service employees. It's uh, about three and a half hour long course with a test at the end. And uh, just about every category that we license and inspect, all the people that are food employees have to take that. Um, it's totally free of charge. It's just your time for being there, but you come out of it with a card that says you passed it and you're good for three years, so. Do you have that online as well, or is it in and in person? Well, there's a couple different options. The class itself, we have live um, in Minot at this office here regularly. There's a schedule on our website. Um, I, I do them in the counties that I cover periodically. Um, I'll be someplace and I'll get a feeling that we need one in McLean County, so I'll do a couple in McLean County and I notify everybody. Um, if you can't make it to a live class, we have a DVD where the entire presentation and everything that you need is on the DVD. And we also have it on our website where you can go there and you can watch everything there. Now with the DVD and the version on our website, the tests aren't there. So if you take it that way to get your actual certification, you still have to come to one of our offices and take the test. Um, this is our main office right here, the one in Minot, but we have offices in you know, Kenmare, Bow Bells, um, Mohall, Botno, uh, Garrison, um, McCluskey and Washburn. So you can take it at any one of those. Okay, a um, couple last thing about cottage foods, labeling, we were talking about that. Um, they're required to do the sign. We talked about the sign or the placard, product made in a kitchen, not inspected by the state or local health department. Um, the following is recommended. Um, for cottage food operators and it's necessary for those that are selling to retail. So that's where the product name, producer's name, address, where it was pre prepared, telephone number or email address, the date that it was made, a complete list of ingredients and allergens. Again, this is a federal thing, not a local thing, all right? 
Um, and the disclaimer, this product was produced in a home kitchen, not subject to state licensure. Um, if it were me, I'd, I'd be putting that on, on everything that is not a single sitting sort of thing. Federal guidelines, um, if you're selling produce or fish to grocery stores, restaurants, schools, etc., the cool labeling, that's the country of origin labeling comes into effect. I like to put this one in there as well because some of our producers do sell to grocery stores and things, right? Um, we ourselves got caught up on this one. Really, it is the, the like the grocery store. We'll use them as an example. It's the grocery store's obligation to post country of origin information on produce. But when it comes down to it, they look back to where they got it from to get that information. Okay, so what you want to know is that if you are selling to a grocery store or um, a retail establishment, you want to make sure that you use these words, grown in, produced in, born, raised, and slaughtered in the United States. Those are the words that you need because, and for, and for my example, right, we sell herbs to grocery stores. Our label had our logo and it and it said, you know, Garden Dwellers Farm, had our full address, Esmond, North Dakota, had the website. We received a very panicked phone call from a, a produce manager in a grocery store saying the inspector was just here and he slapped me with 15 violations, one for every different kind of herb we had of yours on the shelf. And I'm like, why? And it was because even though we had our farm name, our farm address, our farm location, we did not have the words grown in or produced in on that label. So you know my husband is, he's on the phone, he's dialing all 10 of the other grocery stores that, you know, going, pull it off the shelf, the inspector's coming! You know. Um, and the next week we had a separate label that we would put on the back of every package until we got our labels changed, okay? So um, if you're dealing with um, retail, selling retail, you might not be putting it on a package, you might be putting it on your carton, on the box that, that your tomatoes are in, but you wanna make sure it says grown in, produced in, or the, the slaughtered information. It must be legible, placed in a conspicuous location where they're likely to be read and understood. Okay? Um, we're going to do this after we take a break. So let's take a break. This is a good spot to take a break. Let's pay. It is quarter to three. Let's come back at five to three. Remember, there's soda and water up here. Some dots, pretzels, caramel corn. Please use the cups. Uh, restrooms across the hall. Some coffee.
from the toilets and urinals and things like that. Ooh. And then the mist spreading out and settling out on the surfaces. So, Isn't that crazy? Yeah, so I places that we license, like restaurants and everything, all the doors that are in the food prep and store and serving areas and everything, yep, they have to <laughs> You know, I heard about the flush, flush. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Aerosolization. Yeah. You know, and uh, I thought about it, and I didn't really realize it was in got this new toilet, right? Oh my gosh. I was absolutely amazed at how dirty the wall was. I so, was stunned. She's going to throw it there. It's called Glow Germ. Uh, glow Gel, that specifically. But anyway. And I think we're going to be doing an activity with it at some point here. But what that, what that stuff basically is, is a shine spray kind of light on it. So I've seen all kinds of cool things where they have products like that. And they'll put it in the toilet and they'll flush it. And then they'll wait a while. And then they'll come in the light and turn it on. And everything in the whole room will Because the, you know, the aerosol comes up and it spreads around and settles off on surfaces. Yeah, it's, uh, it's always really pleasant when you see those things. Uh, two crushes. Seen it on toothbrushes in people's bathrooms where you know they did something like that, and it's like, oh, now it's on your toothbrush too. Oh, yeah. Mythbusters did a big thing, you know. Yeah. You know, watch Mythbusters, they did some big thing when you turn off flushing and where the, you know, where the bacteria and fecal, the fecal yeah. forms are, you know. <laughs> they say men's beards are one of the worst. I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> Not mine. Yeah, whatever. I, I sanitize mine. I, I was going to say, sanitize yeah. mine. Every, every four hours or less. It doesn't cool. look bleached. Come on. Pathogenic organisms. That was the first <laughs> time I ever heard about it, is they were talking about how with bacteria were in men's beards. You know, humans in general are loaded with bacteria. Yeah. I mean, that's the, just the unfortunate part of the deal. When she, when she was talking about workers, yeah, when you have places and things get contaminated, it's because of the people. It's not because of being in the package in the mail and she could hardly get it in the house because she you know she's not very mobile or you know and she'd get it in the house and she'd open it up and it'd be like buttercup squash or something <laughs> and she'd be like like we don't have any buttercup squash in North Dakota come on you know but he was just so proud that he had you know look at what I grew you know it's so good this year it tastes so wonderful you'd have to uh, send the, the squash to her and she was always just why does he waste all that on, on sending that heavy thing in the mail a lot of money wasted. I can buy a squash here, you know. But it's like, Mom, you're, you're missing the point. And it's funny you should mention that because I was going to send our son this pumpkin, this specific pumpkin that he had asked for, and it looked really nice and everything. And I'm like, why am I sending that? So I cut it up and used the pumpkin, and I'm sending him the seeds. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> you're your own. <laughs> Perfect. Well, we do have everybody back except Jamie, so if you're 
ready, ready to go. Let's just keep going and haul through this. Um, we've talked a lot already today about the, the whole pH thing, pH of 4.6 or less. <coughs> Those are acidified foods. And I understand that most of you are produce growers. You know, some of you do eggs or other products. But you know what? You're going to have that year. You're going to have that year when you have an overabundance of something and you're going to be going, how can I sell this, get rid of it, process it, whatever, so that I'm not taking a loss for, for my business. You know, it's going to be salsa, it's going to be something, right? Um, so it's good for you to know, and also if you're working with other producers, uh, at the farmer's market or wherever, and they say, gee, you know, I read this whole 4.6 thing and I just don't get it. Well, we're, we're going to get it. We are going to go out into the little atrium over here, and I have brought a jar of, of my burger butter, okay? My burger butter is basically an approved recipe that I started with. I started with um, a recipe for homemade ketchup, right? That would, if I had left it alone and just used that, that would have been an approved recipe, which used to be part of the, the uh, guidelines. If you're familiar with the old guidelines, they said it needed to be an approved recipe. Okay, but then I took that approved recipe and I changed it. I added a whole bunch of basil to it. And I cook it off a little bit differently um, than is in the recipe. I still can it, water bath it the right amount of time and everything, but because I changed that recipe, there is the potential to me, uh, for me to have changed that pH level. Right? So uh, it really needs to be tested. If I'm going to sell it at the farmer's market or wherever, I need to test it. So I brought along some of my burger butter and we're just gonna quickly walk through how do you do that pH testing, okay? So let's go up to the atrium.
Again, it's, it's not going to protect you. It's no measure of, of you know, liability insurance. Um, but it is showing that, which comes into play if there is a liability case, did you do everything you could do reasonably expected, reasonably, reasonably? What a reasonable person would do. What a reasonable person would do. Those are the words. Did you do what a reasonable person would do to protect your customer? So it's that added extra measure. Okay, <coughs> proto safety begins with <coughs> commitment. Assessing the risks, and this is this is for whether it's produce or baked goods or whatever. Assessing the risks comes first. Implementing the practices that are going to make things safer. Monitor those practices. That's important. Use corrective actions and keep records. Those are the five pieces, the five steps that you want to make sure you follow. When we talk about assessing risk, that means looking at each step of the process and determining what and where the risk factors are. Um, and it, it takes some critical thinking to do that. Um, you need to know what a risk might be. Like if you didn't know that it would be risky to have the compost, animal manure compost pile um, so close to your production, you wouldn't know that it was a risk. So it takes a little bit of education to identify those risks or to ask for assistance. Um, your health units will help. Um, folks like me at Dakota College, Keith Knudsen, we will help you come out and assess those risks as well. Um, research your processes and learn about farm and food safety. There's a ton of information on the internet. There's lots of information in the libraries. Um, and then make yourself a list of places that might be risky. Each farm is different. Every farm is different. Practices to reduce risks are different on everyone's farm. I remember when we first started doing this and we were talking about hand washing and, and having to have hand washing facilities and some producers were going, oh my God, does that mean I need to you know, build a bathroom by my field because my field is two miles away from my home and you know, basically we just go out and we pick the stuff and we bring it home. And, and so we started learning about, you know, how can we do a hand washing facility, a hand washing station out in a field? How can we do it at, you know, next to a high tunnel? How can we do it in a wash pack facility? And we started to learn those things. But all of those things are best done by the person who does the work, the person who works on the farm. 
And every commodity is different. What is grown on trees and, and berries and bushes and nuts um, is different than field corn or sweet corn, and that's different than melons. Um, and do you harvest by hand or by machine? And is it single versus multiple harvests? Every farm is different. So then you want to implement good practices. Writing procedures for safety are sometimes called standard operating procedures, and they can be put into your food safety plan or combined with your food safety plan, um, and they're usually combined with things such as uh, checklists, for uh, record keeping. <coughs> they don't have to be complicated or time consuming. You need to do what works for you and do what makes sense in your operation. Um, many times you, you'll see templates and you'll see all sorts of things to help you build a food safety plan. But for some people those are just too complicated. Um, or they, they suggest things that, that just won't work on that particular farm or operation. So you need to make what works for you. And I'll give you an example. On our farm, we use a checklist to make sure that we're following all of the um, cleaning and sanitizing that we need to do for our wash pet facility and for the area around it and for the field and, and all of those things, right? That checklist honestly is like longer than two pages. One-sided, okay, granted, but it's one side, one page, one side of the next, and it goes into the third page. It sounds really long, right? But at our farm, we harvest every Monday night and Tuesday. So that means Sundays are a good day for my husband and I to go through that checklist and do all of those things. And we do it together. So while we're cleaning out our wash pack facility, I might be running the water in the triple sinks, the, the soap, the clear rinse, the, the sanitizer, the chlorine, right? So I'm running the water, and at that point, he's checking to make sure that there's no debris around the outside of the building, that, that the lawn has gotten mowed, he's checking to make sure that um, we do have a couple of uh, those mousetrap things outside the doors, he's <coughs> making sure there's no mice in there, checking to make sure there's no evidence of mice on the floors. So he can check off two or three things while I'm in the water. And then I'm taking the water as it runs and I'm cleaning off the countertops. And then I check off the countertops. And then he comes in and he takes the rags and with the three different, the wash, rinse, sanitize, and he wipes down the door handles and the doors. And then he checks that off. So it really goes quite quickly, all right? Um, but having that checklist, and I tell you, after doing it every Sunday, Every summer for 15 years, well, we haven't had the checklist for 15 years, we know that checklist by heart, right? But there are still days that we'll look at each other and go, did you take out the garbage? Oh, no, you know. Or we'll look at the checklist and go, oh, we forgot to check the temperature in the cooler. Got to go back in and check the temperature in the cooler. So the checklist is really easy. Now, when my son was helping us, being a young millennial, needing his tablet and his phone with him at every time moment, he thought, let's just electric you know, make this electronic, let's put it on the computer, right? And all you have to do is have my tablet and, and push this and it'll bring up and then you can, yeah. There was a couple weeks it didn't get done at all and I, I finally said that that can't be because we're just not electronic people kind of people, right? We need the paper. And I like the paper trail it creates for, for us. Um, so you have to do what works for you Use the tools that make sense for you. If I have another producer down by Bismarck. She's totally electronic everything. She uses her phone, carries it with her all the time. Use her QuickBooks are in there. Her Egg Squared, which is all of her, her production records are all in her phone. They go to the cloud or wherever the heck electronic information goes nowadays, you know. And so for her, having it on her phone makes sense. So you, and I know some producers that just have a little tablet in their pocket. <coughs> so do what works for you and for your operation. Um, monitoring is performed on a schedule or during a specific activity. Again, specific to you, right? For us, Sundays works great. For other people, that might not work at all. You might have to break it up and do part of it, you know, Monday before you harvest and Tuesday before you do this. Um, so do what works. It allows you to verify that practices are being completely per properly completed properly and identifies problems before they impact food safety, such as evidence of animal intrusion and fecal contamination. 
That's another thing that we don't do on Sundays. We do that just before we harvest. Barry and I go out really early in the morning, just before we start harvesting, and the two of us walk the field. And we look, was there deer that ran across there overnight? Um, was there birds that you know landed in overnight? Because we're kind of on the flyway for the ducks and the geese thing, right? Okay. And we look for, did anybody poop on anything? And if they did, we take care of it right then and there before we start harvesting. So those are the types of things that looking for risk and monitoring it can help with. Now, what if we do find that, what do we do? When we go back in to the wash pack room, then we write down, we found this poop here, we removed it from the field, this is where we put it, and then that person initials it. Okay, that's the record keeping. I wonder if we get that one back in there again. Oh my gosh. something new unless you're good at that and comfortable with that um, but there are a lot of uh, templates out there just Google that um, or put it into any search engine and you should be able to come with up with some good record keeping checklists um, or give me a call it needs to be convenient we mentioned that one thing you want to know though they must be signed and dated if you're ever subject to a good agricultural practices review um, Heaven forbid that recall we were talking about at the very beginning ever does happen and they're looking for trace back. Um, for your own protection, what a reasonable person would do, sign and date those records, okay? Um, keep all records for at least two years or 25 if you're clear soon. We talked about handwritten, uh, invest in a tool that'll work. Clipboards are my best friend. Um, pens tied to long pieces of string. Uh, you've never seen a person so happy in your life as when you see me with a new pen that has, you know, some sort of attachment thing to it or magnetic thing to it. I'm like, yeah, I can go on the clipboard. Um, plastic page sleeves, duct tape, whatever it takes. Um, establish record keeping schedules that make sense for you. When does it need to be recorded? Who's in charge of documenting it? Because remember, we need a signature. How often does it need to be done? Do you need to do that particular thing every day? Like with us, do we need to go out in the field and check for fecal matter every day? Not really, because we only harvest once a week. And as long as we make sure that it's clean and it's out of there before we harvest, once a week for us is good. But now if I was doing five or six farmer's markets and harvesting you know, five times a week, then yeah, I might want to do it every week. Build this record keeping into normal routines. My husband has a checklist that he keeps on the front of the four-wheeler because every time we go to do that particular task, we take the four-wheeler and the trailer. And so it's right there, right on the front of the four-wheeler. Written document defining how to complete a specific food or safety practice is a standard operating procedure. It's step-by-step -step instructions of how that procedure is done. Um, it includes things such as the location and name of any supplies needed, when and how often the practice should be completed, what records are needed, and who will be in charge. Um, I have down here practice writing an SOP based on the time. I don't think we're going to take the time to, to write one, but let's just kind of talk through one quickly, okay? Because some people hear standard operating procedure and they go, deer in the headlights, right? You know, all glazed over. It doesn't have to be that tough. How many of you have a dog? Pretty much everybody with Phil. Sorry, Phil, do you have a cat? We've got a bunch of them. All right. Okay. Those of you with dogs understand that at certain times of the year, particularly, but usually most of the year, you have to. 
to at some point pick up poop, right? So let's just quickly walk through the standard operation, operating procedure for scoop and poop. All right, so first, step-by-step -step instructions and location and name of supplies. Who's going to do it? At my house, it's me, <laughs> yes. So our standard operating procedure would say, Holly Mobby will gather all the supplies for scooping the poop. Then under that, it will say location of supplies. The appropriate poop scooping shovel is located on the back side of the house by the LP tank. That is the only shovel that shall be used for scooping poop on Garden Dwellers Farm. Why do we write it that way? Because I never want that shovel to be taken out in the field. I never want that shovel to go into my produce area, right? It's got poop on it, okay? So the only shovel to be used during this process is located by the LP tank on the back of the house. What else do I need? I need a bucket. Now, you'll be happy to know that the two buckets sitting in the back of the room um, that we will be using in another activity later on have never been used for scooping poop. <coughs> Why? Because my standard operating procedure says the only bucket that will be used for scooping poop at Garden Roller's Farm is located next to the shovel by the LP tank. And it has a great big red X on it so that nobody will ever pick up that on, on a busy time and go, oh, you know, I've got 25 extra cucumbers that won't fit in the bin, let's just grab this bucket and go. All right? Um, then, you're going to walk the entire yard, and I probably would put a description in there for it, north and south, east, west, house to production lot, Quonset barn, and find all that you can. Once you have done that, the proper place to dispose of it is in the septic tank, period. That is the only place it can't go in the compost pile, it can't go get chucked into the high weeds, it can't go anyplace else, it needs to go here. This will be done on a daily basis from May to October. My name and the date. There's your standard operating procedure. It's that simple. It doesn't have to be big and complicated, just who's going to do it, where are the supplies, when and how often are you going to do it, and what records are necessary. I'm going to sign and date it that I did that every day. Okay? Standard operating procedures. They're a very important part of your farm food safety plan and a very important part of making sure that you're keeping everything as safe as you possibly can. You can verify that they're done and done properly like this and it ensures that everyone is sticking to the same routine because maybe at your house you have someone that helps you with the poop scooping and it's not always just you. Look for trends or outliers that will eliminate those problems. Okay, so you've got your standard operating procedure for poop scooping and guess what? All of a sudden the shovel goes missing or the bucket tends to go missing or they tend to always miss this part of the yard. Don't know why, they just never go over there. You can look for those trends, all right? And they may be required for certain activities. The Farm Food Safety, the Produce Rule, Food Safety Modernization Act Produce Rule, actually um, says that you need to do some of these if you are not exempt. If you are qualified exempt or not exempt at all, there are certain standard operating procedures that you will need to have. Okay, basic good agricultural practices. We're going to start with some of the basics. Remember, there were certain categories. The first one is worker hygiene. Proper hygiene procedures should be established and included in hygiene and health training programs. You want to maintain records of that training. Toilets and hand washing stations must be available, accessible, and properly maintained. Human pathogens are the major source, and workers' hands um, are, again, a major source. So the single most effective public health measure that you can do is make sure that you have proper hand washing. What we do at our place, and I'm, you know, this is just an example, I'm not saying you have to. Like I mentioned, we have a farm food safety plan. In our farm food safety plan, we have our worker hygiene section in there. And every year, it sounds silly, but every year my husband and I sit down and we go over that farm food safety plan. Because every year we find something that changes. There's, you know, it might just be a little bit, 
but there's always something that changes, right? And then we have a place to sign it and date it. And even though it's just him and I, the two of us go over it. That's my worker training. Once a year when we sit down and we go over that, that's my worker training. Sign, date it, maintain records. Now, toilets in the hand washing facility. According to OSHA, toilets available, <coughs> must be available within a five minute drive or a half a mile. Because I get that question sometimes. <coughs> hand washing stations should be either at the edge of each field or if you're, you're on a homestead sort of area, you have to have it within that production area. You are a worker too, so when you read these things from state health agencies and state health regulatory agencies that say workers must be trained and you think to yourself, I don't have any workers, it doesn't apply to me. You have to think of yourself as a worker too. Um, workers don't just come into contact with germs on the farm and they don't just work on the farm. We're also at those farmers markets, we're at that farm stand and what is some of the germiest things, we were just talking about this besides beards? Money and cell phones. Money, Money and cell phones are some of the germiest things out there. Um, so I have my thoughts on that, you know, I like, remember you can't sanitize something that's dirty. Um, I do like to have some sort of hand washing station or sanitizing station at my farmer's market booth. Um, and another way to do that is if you have enough people to have one person be handling the money, one person, person helping the customers, that's awesome. But not all of us can do that. Um, relative contamination, feces, of course, clothing. Um, I know certain producers that wear the same jeans out to the field and then out to the, feed the cattle and then back out to the production lot <coughs> um, and have the dirtiest clothes and then they put the same dirty clothes back on the next day. Make sure you, you and your workers have clean clothing. Your hands, of course, um, your footwear, tools and equipment, and also if you have illness or injury, can all be ways that contamination is, is spread. So fresh fruits and vegetables often receive no additional processing, we talked about that. Workers need to use food safety practices every day to reduce the risk. It can't just be, ooh, the inspector's coming, we gotta do this today, or ooh, we got guests coming and they're gonna see what we do, we're gonna do this today. It needs to be a practice that you do every day and they are learned by repetition. So making sure that you do them, um, make sure you have successful implementation. If you have visitors on your farm, growers must make visitors aware of the farm's food safety policies and provide access to toilet and hand washing facilities if they're going to be handling your product in your field. Other key information for visitors um, that they should know is areas of the farm that they're allowed to visit and not visit the importance of not coming if they are ill, how to wash their hands appropriately, and instructions to keep pets at home un unless you know that's a necessary part of what you are doing and then there's a whole different set of rules. Uh, but these are things that I like, and we hold a lot of classes at my farm. And I judge every time I do a class. It's like, where am I going to have these people and what am I going to have them do? Are they going to be allowed to walk out into my production field? If so, they get a little email beforehand saying, we're gonna walk out in the production <coughs> field. But I ask that you not handle the produce in the field. Let me pick and give to you, and then you can taste or smell or do whatever I'm giving it to you for to do. You know, and I will kind of give them these instructions, and I do tell them, please keep your pets at home. Um, and in our restroom that we have the visitors use, it has the hand washing thing and we do make sure that if they're going to touch produce that they wash their hands first. I mean, we take these precautions with visitors. Evaluate contamination risks before and during harvest. Um, never harvest produce destined for fresh market that is visibly contaminated with feces. And that's all kinds of feces. And sometimes, because of your record keeping, you might learn something. You know what I learned? I learned that one of the things that we as gardeners or producers do is one of the worst things for feces, believe it or not. 
And that is, I go out in the spring and I'm ready to seed my seeds. And what do I do? I, I tap in the, the stick at this end and I run my string line to the other end and tap in the stick down there and I put my seeds in. And now I'm so happy. And about midway through the season, we're doing our walkthrough, right, which we do before harvest every time. And it dawns on me that the birds love those sticks at the end of the rows because they sit there and they just poop all day long. And that I was losing the production from that end of the row because of the birds sitting on the stick pooping. So I don't put sticks out there anymore, you know? I'll put a rock on the ground to mark each end or something. Peggy, yeah. Well, you know, we have the worst time with that too because of staking tomatoes or anything like that. How do you avoid it? Exactly, <laughs> it's, it's really it, tough. Um, you know, you can put, we'll talk about deterring wildlife later, but if there are, you know, CDs you can hang or, or something like that, um, that can keep the birds from landing there in the first place because it's very evident that the, the sticks with tomatoes, the staking, mm -hmm. or the, the cages or whatever are a necessary part of production, but darn if those birds don't like to land on them, don't yeah. they? Yeah. Like. Right, so if you... Let's have weird birds. You maybe have more predator birds that keep the little sparrows and That's small. That's a lot of hawks. Yeah, see, so keep the small birds busy in a way. That's possible. Um, so there, you know, maybe that's it. Maybe you need one of those owls or one of those hawk things, you know, to make them think that, that they shouldn't land there. But if fecal matter has touched any part of the produce that you were thinking of harvesting, Make sure you harvest not only that piece that has the poop on, but the piece, pieces around it, okay, the, the vegetation, in my case. Um, if, if it's a tomato and there are other tomatoes way down here, you don't need to empty off the whole tomato plant. Don't, don't make it sound like that's what you need to do. But you want to make sure that you are very certain that fecal matter is gone. That fecal matter needs to be removed from the field, away from the field, where it's not going to contaminate anything else. Don't do that at the same time as, as harvesting. harvesting. No, you want to do that, as I mentioned, before harvest, okay? Um, never harvest dropped produce. This is a good one because the Food Safety Modernization Act uh, really is quite unclear on this one. It does say never harvest dropped produce, but what it says is no gleaning allowed don't harvest produce off the ground, and there was another statement in there, which made it very unclear on what we were supposed to do with things that grow on the ground, like cucumbers. So that is still up for debate <coughs> and being worked through by the, the small groups at this time. Um, so we're not sure what's gonna happen there. But when, in this case, we say never harvest dropped produce, what we're saying is no gleaning. In other words, if, if you're growing apples and you wanna take apples to the market, don't go up and pick the apples off the ground. Just pick the apples off the tree. Anything else you want to say about gleaning, Jamie, or, or drop produce? Um, what's, what your you what's your definition of gleaning? Is um, those things that naturally drop okay. fruit. Um, you know, fruit gets overripe or gets ripe and it drops on the ground, or vegetables. Don't pick it up off the ground and. Uh, particular type of cantaloupe that I grow, when it gets good and ripe, it just falls right off. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not gonna take that. Only use clean harvest and packing containers. Oh, Lord, we're talking about that when we talk about equipment. Um, so, resources that you wanna provide for hand washing and for toileting. Uh, toilets, of course, toilet paper, soap, clean water, paper towels, a container to catch the waste water if you are not in a, a fully functioning restroom. Garbage cans, a first aid kit, and you need to have a break area. Um, your hand washing area can be something very simple. And do I have pictures? Look at the next slide. Oh. On, the, on your thing. Down at the end. Down at the end. Okay, yeah. so we'll get to some pictures of some hand washing stations. The important points that I like to make with people, clean water, paper towels, you know, having the, the hand towel that you normally have in your bathroom, not, not acceptable. Paper towels. A garbage can to put them in and the container to catch the wastewater. Because if you're setting up this hand washing booth out by your field or something, 
You don't want that water running back into your production area, so you have to have that container. First aid kits, always important because accidents happen, right? Here we go, drinking water and break areas. Workers should be provided with drinking water to reduce the risk of heat exhaustion. We all like to drink water and we all like to carry our little, our favorite little water bottle with us, right? Um, but don't take it out into the production lot. Don't take it out when you're harvesting. Have a separate little area. Now, do you have to build a shelter and have a room and all of that? No. Our break area is simply a picnic table that is outside of the production area under a shady tree and we all know that that is the break area. So when we all go trucking out there to harvest, we all, you know, go past the picnic table, drop our water bottles there and keep on going to the production area. And when we want to drink water, we go sit down and we take one and we wash our hands and go back out do it again, right? Healthy workers are better able to do their jobs and implement food safety. Workers must maintain personal cleanliness, avoid contact with animals. Sorry, you don't have a dog. You want one? I saw an ad for puppy. Oh, I've had lots of them. Okay. Um, we have dogs at my place. And one dog has a very specific job. She is our farm dog. It is her job to keep the gophers out of the field. It's her job to keep the deer out of the field. It's her job to keep the raccoons out of the field. It's her job to chase the pigeons off of the barn so they're not pooping on there. Um, she has a job. So putting her away somewhere is not very practical on harvest days, especially. However, she knows harvest days. When she sees some of our, our tubs and totes coming out and us putting gloves on and things like that, she has gotten to the point where she knows she's not going to get petted all day. That's just all there is to it. You don't, number one rule at our house, don't touch the dog on harvest day. That's it. We have another little dog, she stays in the house. She gets kennel. From the time we go out until the time we're done, she goes in her little kennel and she stays in there. That's how we ensure that nobody touches the dog during parts, okay? Um, and it would go for the same with cats. I know they're, they're cute, you want to stretch their little ears, but no, avoid contact with the animals. Maintain any gloves in a sanitary condition. If they're not disposable gloves and you're using fresh new ones, make sure that they are clean before you put them on to go out and harvest again. Now I know you have some thoughts on gloves usually, Jamie. Um, for yes. just general uh, growers or? Yeah, for producers, yes. <laughs> you know. You know, best practices. We're talking best practices here. If you're just looking at just best practices overall, if you want to prevent the spread of illness from your workers to other people through your produce, I mean, you want to minimize the amount of contact that they have with it with their bare hands. I mean, that's just the way to go. So the, the less bare hand contact there is with the food that's ready to eat, the, the less chance there is that fecal material and pathogens from their hands are going to get transferred onto the food. So, yeah, just as little as possible. If you can use gloves for parts of your harvest, as long as they're clean, that is far better than just bare hands. Awesome. Actually, too, with, I just want to throw in, yep. with, with all the things that you have on this slide right here, um, th there's a document that the FDA has put together, and it's it's aimed at food establishments. So, I mean, that's, that's the first thing. It, and it's called the Employee Health and Hygiene Handbook. It talks about these things, and the language that it uses is really good, where you could get a copy of that. It's free offline, you know, various places online. And it talks to your employees about washing your hands and no jewelry. And, you know, if you're sick with these symptoms, don't touch the food. And if you're sick with these symptoms, or you go to the doctor and they tell you you have this illness, you know, tell your employer, don't touch the food. Get that document. If you're writing SOBs, put some of the things from there in there. I mean, they're already written for you in there. You can just copy them and use them. What's it called? Uh, the Employee Health and Hygiene Handbook, as put out by the FDA. Awesome. Excellent. Employee Health and Hygiene Handbook as put out by the FDA. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, make sure everybody knows to notify the person in charge if they're not feeling well or they're, they're ill um, and to wash their hands appropriately. When must your hands be washed? After using the toilet, before starting or returning to work, before and after eating and smoking, this is the one a lot of people don't know before putting on your gloves. Wash your hands before you put your gloves on. 
after touching animals or animal waste, and any other times your hands may become contaminated. Proper hand washing, wet your hands first. Now I think, you know, hand washing has become a big deal in the last five to 10 years. You know, when we were little, man, you never washed your hands until you went to bed at night, right? Go take a shower, or, or if you were in one of those households, it was before every meal. Go wash up before you sit down to eat, right? Um, but other than that, we never washed our hands. Now it's like, oof, you wash your hands all the time. And there's little signs everywhere like this that say, wet your hands first. Soak them for 20 seconds, scrub them, rinse them, towel dry, and then use the, the towel to turn off the test. This is why the, the paper disposable towels are important, okay? It's because this is the proper hand washing um, scenario. So, um, again, although we all know it, we're not all great about doing it the right way. And even if we do, do the, the 20 second thing. You sing happy birthday, or you recite the alphabet, or you count to 20 really slowly. You don't always wash appropriately. So, um, Peggy, you're not feeling well. I'm not gonna pick on you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, so we're gonna practice. I'm feeling better. <laughs> we're gonna practice. I'm just gonna go the first three right here. I have some lotion. I'm gonna rub it on your hands, okay? And it, it's non-toxic, non-allergenic, um, all those good things. Um, rub it on your hands, wait for it to dry just a second, and then I want you to go in the restroom, and I would like you to wash your hands for five seconds, you to wash your hands for 10 seconds, and you to wash your hands for 20 seconds, okay? You're giving me the look like you don't want to play along with this. Okay, just making sure. All right, I don't want to force, oops, I don't want to force anybody to do anything. Hey, everybody's hands are dry anyway, right? We needed a little lotion. I know mine are. <coughs> because I wash my hands so often. The restrooms are located across the hall. Just uh, when you think you've got it rubbed in there and dry it off a little bit, go uh, remember five seconds, don't 10 rinse seconds, them, right? I mean, seconds. Don't, uh, Follow the procedure. Don't dry them off. <laughs> Follow the procedure. Okay. Like you're supposed to, <coughs> like we've all learned. They've got uh, paper towels. <laughs> no, the paper, yeah, they don't. They don't, okay. Well, the one in the women's doesn't work for a Oh, it's on the left-hand side. So if you're right on by the, the sinks. On the, if you're going across the wall, that one is kind of broken. But if you go to the one right on okay. the left-hand side. I'll take some of those just in case. Okay. Okay. It works exactly. just in case. Whoa. No paper towels in the women's restroom. <laughs> I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't that one, so. <laughs> the, the dispenser just dispenses like like an inch or two of paper towel every time. Oh, so this one. you don't get enough. See, I don't know what the ladies do here, but the men are very diligent about stocking the soap and the paper towels. I'm sure they are. I, I can't attest to what the women do. <laughs> when they come back, Jimmy, if I can get you to get the lights, that'd okay. be awesome. There were paper towels in there, weren't there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You got a good UV light that you're going to shine on? I am. With the yellow cake. There's Where it says you do not need hot water, but I can't even talk, hot water. I use cold water, just so you know. <laughs> just, yeah. uh, Is that different for your producer guidelines? Under the food regulations, you have to use hot water. It has to be at least 100 degrees okay. at, at a hand wash station. Yeah. Under see, FISMA, it's not. That one on the end, that Igloo type cooler, that's, you know, if you if you look at places that we do like temporary events, you know, and for, for produce growers, it'd be the same thing on the field. But at temporary events like the fair, if they have a stick stand or something, that's a setup just like what we're going to recommend. They got a cooler like that. They fill it up with 100, 110 degree water. Um, I paper can't towels. see very well in There's the picture. There's paper towels on the side here. Yep. The butt, the the spigot should be a twist, not a push button. Right. Um, that's one of the things that we talked to them about, and that's a hand wash station right there. That's okay. Um, and maybe if you just want to come this way a little bit, Jamie's going to get the lights, and we're going to see how well everybody did. Let's 
Feel that a few. Um, turn your hands over. There. See, this is even when we wash our hands really, really well, we tend to skip our cuticles. We tend to skip usually um, down by our thumbs. Look at that thumb. Mm -hmm. And you thought you washed really well, well didn't you? Seconds. Every five, five seconds. seconds so it's quick. Right. Okay, so yeah. now let's look at 10 seconds. Okay. Now, I understand when our hands are dry and, and we've got, you know, cracks and wrinkles, but we have those all summer long, right? Now turn your hands over. Look at the, the cuticles. We usually tend to miss that. And around our thumbs. Um, every time I do this, I get here. I get yeah. I, I always get, and let's see Clara Sue, because Clara Sue did it 20 seconds like she was supposed to. Oh my goodness, look at how beautiful they are. A little bit right oh, there. Got it? Okay, yeah. now turn them over. Let's I got see. I'll be there too. Yep, but cuticles, um, pretty good. And thumbs, you did pretty good on. Cuticles, <coughs> pretty good though. So the 20 seconds makes a big difference, right? So where you get rough skin or whatever, that's really, really got to scrub again. So that sanitizing gel, I mean, I haven't seen none of that. That's not recommended with water, soap and water. Or? Remember, you can't sanitize something that's not clean. Yeah, yeah. If, you're, if you're touching produce, I'm never even sanitizing. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say on the back of the gel? If it just did contact the poison control center immediately. Yeah. So don't put your hands in there. Put that on your hands. Put your hands on produce. Gotcha. Okay. Um, for those of you that may have been out washing your hands and, and missed it, Jimmy was saying when, when they recommend a hand washing station, uh, you know, and this could be at the end of the field or, or at a farmer's market or at a temporary event, something like that, that this one on the end is almost exactly what they're looking for. Um, uh, Jamie was also saying that in the food code, you have to use hot water or warm water, 110 degrees. Is that well, 100 or, 100 or above is hot water. 100 or above. Food Safety Modernization Act, you do not. In, in that, um, they're saying cold water is fine. Um, but look, we've just got an equal cooler. The, the spigot on it can't be one that you have to push down to get the water to run continually. It needs to be one of those that you flip up or whatever and then it runs, flows freely. Um, they have a bucket, a drain bucket to catch the water. They have paper towels right here. I'm not sure what this is on top, but what this is missing is a garbage can for the paper towels, right? So over here, same sort of thing. They've got the container, they've got um, the catch basin for the water. Five is a place where they can store extra paper towels. That's where their paper towels are being stored so they're not being moved on by birds. There's the container to get rid of the paper towels. Um, this odd one over here um, is just a ingenious invention of how to pump the water, right? So they're using this siphon to siphon the water from a covered, closed container, get that up and through the little spigot into this one. Just a little different. Clean clothes every day. Footwear cleanliness is important. Um, having specific designated footwear for the field um, or footwear that can be cleaned, washed, um, is a very good idea and a best practice that you really should be following. Gloves change when they become contaminated, dirty, or torn. Aprons, gloves, or other food safety equipment should be removed before using the toilet and should be stored in a clean designated area when not in use. So if you are the kind that wears an apron to market or whatever, be sure that that's clean as well. That's, that's a pretty easy one to forget. You come home from market and you toss it in the market tub with the cash box and everything else. You don't see it again until the next week, right? Okay, always remember to wash those as well. Worker illness. There are some very specific uh, words that are used to define when and what defines a worker as ill. Those symptoms are nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fever, jaundice. Think of the Pepto-Bismol commercial, right? Okay, except not the heartburn. Okay, think you might be able to get heartburn, nausea, upset stomach. Okay. Um, the, the very specific wording that our health districts look for in your farm food safety plan or in your standard operating procedure is written on this slide. Any worker who is ill or appears to be ill with a possible communicative disease will be sent home or assigned work away from crop production in areas and harvested produce. Any worker 
diarrhea, jaundice, vomiting, or sore throat accompanied by fever may not perform any tasks in the crop production areas or in any area where produce is stored, sorted, handled, packaged, washed, or otherwise worked with or on. That's the wording they're gonna to wanna to see. And that's what you wanna follow. It's not just, oh, I'm gonna write it in there so I'm gonna pass, right? That's, that's the definition of being ill. Um, injuries, a first aid kit. I've got first aid kits all over my farm. You know, they're not that expensive. Once a year, I go around at least once a year and make sure all the band-aids are good and everything. Um, but make sure that you have them available and close by. Clean and bandage all wounds. If the wound is on the hand, make sure you, you're putting gloves on to create a double barrier. Discard any produce that have, may have been contaminated. Just get rid of it. Clean and sanitize any items that came in contact with bodily fluids. Was that person using a scissors or a knife or a clippers or a whatever? Um, make sure those get cleaned and sanitized and report all injuries to the person in charge of that standard operating procedure, right? And worker illness training. Worker health and hygiene is critical to food safety. It's one of the, the top places where contamination can occur. It's one of the highest risk areas. Everyone who works with the produce should be trained. Visitors must be made, be made aware of the policies too. Training should emphasize health and hygiene practices that reduce risk, and a written program should be developed and documented. On the water. Anytime water comes in contact with fresh produce, its quality determines the potential for pathogen contamination, since water may be a carrier of a number of type of microorganisms. <clears throat> this is important when we say, anytime water comes in contact, we think about it, we, we water it when it's in the field, <clears throat> we wash it when it comes out of the field, we maybe store it um, maybe with some ice that we've purchased, um, you know, there's water that comes into contact with it, maybe with fertilizer or pesticide sprays. So there's lots of water in this type of operation and contaminated water is the most rapid method of contaminating produce. So, how many of you are on public, a public water supply? A couple, several. Um, how many of you have a well? <laughs> several. And how many of you are using surface water? Cool. Okay. This is lower risk to high risk. Okay. Because they are public water sources, they have certain standards that they have to meet as well, and so they are less of a risk. Well water, of course, um, it's a bit less risky than groundwater because it's usually a well is below ground, it's uh, covered, um, it's protected from certain risks that you might have inherent in the environment. Right? But well, surface water is <coughs> just a well. I mean, we've had our test and it's fine for drinking. It's 465 feet deep, so there's not a whole lot of surface issues. How often should it be tested? That's a really good question because um, at a minimum once a year, if you are um, subject to the Food Safety Modernization Act, you're going to have to test it at least three times a year and then average that over a certain period of year. Okay. Um, some of our health districts recommend twice a year. The state health department recommends twice a year. Jamie. If you were to do anything that would move you into our jurisdiction as a licensed facility, our newest requirements are you use water from wells monthly testing. Monthly. monthly. That's the EPA standard for safe drinking water. Okay. And you know, I can't stress enough how important it is because I, I drink five, I refill my water bottle, which is a 16, 17 ounce water bottle um, from our tap. And I drink five of those a day in the summer, all the time. We test our water. So I think it was maybe three years ago, right? Um, we harvest, we package. Yes, we had had the water tested, but not that particular year. It was the fall before, right? And I'm drinking five bottles of water, and I'm fine. So we go out, we harvest, we package, we deliver to all of these grocery stores. And while Barry is delivering to my not, he drops off the water sample. And I get a phone call by the end of the day saying, you have E. coli in your water. 
and I get on the phone and I call my husband and I say go back to all the grocery stores and pull all of our product off the shelves because we have non-potable water. We have E. coli in our water. Now, I drink five 16 ounce bottles of this stuff every day and I feel fine. If there was E. coli in there, wouldn't have I have gotten sick? No, not necessarily because my immune system is different than a child or a senior or someone with a compromised immune system. So we had to take, as we mentioned in those steps, right, we had to take corrective actions. And we bleached the well and we ran it out and we bleached it again and we had it tested and, and did everything that was necessary to do to ensure that we had clean, safe water before we reharvested and sent product back out again. So sometimes your water, even if it's a well and it's 400 feet deep, ours is 200 and some feet deep, protected, has the most beautiful uh, well cover and well paint you've ever seen, fully concrete line, gorgeous. You'd never think that thing would be, it's on a hill, there's no livestock anywhere around for runoff, um, and it was still infected with E. coli. Yes, Jane. The testing that we do um, for the water, there's, there's two stages to the test. So the first test is just gonna be for coliform bacteria in general. And that's any type of coliform bacteria. If you find it in the water, that's an indication that some sort of contamination got in the water. The second test is specifically for E. coli. So a lot of times you'll get a notice that your water sample failed for coliform, but it didn't fail for E. coli. Something contaminated something. If you get a positive test for E. coli, it's because there's fecal material in the water. That's where that comes from. So uh, like I said, a lot of times you'll get a positive coliform test, and, and I work with growers and other people on this. If you touch your finger inside the cap of the bottle, you are gonna get a positive coliform test and your water sample is gonna fail. So make sure you test correctly and everything. And if you get a positive test, that's not necessarily meaning you've been drinking poopy water for a long time. But if it's positive for E. coli, something really bad happened. When I'm taking my water samples, I, I always wash my hands, put on disposable gloves, then take the water sample, seal it up, and then, okay. That's how I, because I'm afraid that, I, that that's what I will do, is that my personal hands will um, contaminate it. We had a facility that failed all summer long one summer. They got the notice from the Department of Health that they had a post that said, you can't drink this water because it fails all the time, it's not safe. So I went out to, uh, to watch the lady take a sample and to talk to her about it. And she came from carrying with her horses, had her big gloves on with like horse stuff on them. <laughs> she took the bottle and screwed off the cap and held it under there and I'm looking at her other hand and her glove fingers are inside the cap. And that's what she'd been doing all summer long. She'd go over there in between caring for horses, <laughs> take the samples, send it in. Yep. Uh, other things to think about with sampling water. You want to get the sample at the place you're getting water from that you're using. <coughs> um, don't take, you know, if, if the reason you're testing it is to test the water that you're putting on your field, don't take the sample from your tap in your house. Take it from where you're using it from. Um, another thing about testing Jamie mentioned is you want to make sure that that water sample gets to the testing lab within the appropriate amount of time. That's very important. Um, another thing is we, since many of you have public water sources, some people think that, oh, I have a public water source, I don't need to worry about it, I don't need to do anything. Um, when really the truth is, the first thing you should do is contact that public water source. They will give you a copy of their testing. But you should still have your water tested, period, you know, maybe not monthly, because things happen in the pipes in your home. Things happen between where their meter stops and your tap begins. Um, you know, so having it periodically tested, not a bad idea. Is, is that written anywhere other than best practices? Are you going to find that in the regulation? No. But it's just one of those best practices. Okay. Um, what else is I going to say about testing? And Oh, yes, potable hoses. Jamie, do you want to address potable hoses? That's one thing I didn't know about. I mean, I was, yeah. yeah. If you're transporting water through a hose that's going to touch food, that hose has to be rated for drinking water. And you can only use it for that drinking water and protect it. Don't don't leave the end of it just sitting on the ground and getting all dirty and everything like that. Um, take very good care of that, of that hose. And if you if you look for a potable water hose, you know the sticker shock will make you fall over dead. If you if you look for a potable water hose online, but if you look for like an RV connection hose, 
that sticker chart will not do. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say. You know, that's exactly the process I went through about eight, <laughs> eight years ago when I was told you have to have a portable water hose. That you, you put that garden hose away. You have to use a portable water hose. And I was like, oh, and I went online and I and I looked up portable water hose. Okay, I got to get one as fast as I can because we're harvesting again in another week. Um, and I about fell over a hundred and some dollars. Okay, um, but <laughs> but then. One of the state inspectors was nice enough to say, oh no, just look for the, the RV hoses. Now we have a specific hose reel, um, one of those box type ones that handles our two potable water hoses um, and it gets brought out on the day we need it, ends attached, put away when we're done using it, um, and that's how we handle that. Okay. Yes. You know how many people have been drinking out of the end of the garden hose for <laughs> I know. Five, I know. We all drink out of the end of the garden hose and, and we're probably better for it. Oh, that was the best, coldest <laughs> summer. Um, but we don't want to do that. When we're dealing with food we're serving to others. Um what about drip line? Drinking from the drip line? No, I mean for watering your garden. It means it. Right. The beauty of tea tape, soaker hoses drip line, unless you're, you're putting it on top of the peas and letting it trickle down, is that it's being applied at the ground level. So then you're okay. So then you're okay. For most instances, the water is not coming in contact with the produce. Um, yes, there are things like carrots and onions where it is, but for most produce, it's not coming in contact with. You still want to have your water tested. Surface water, um, that's, a, that's a really big area, um, and I would suggest contacting a resource, either your local health or state health department or some of us at Dakota College, if you have concerns about your surface water and how you use it, because they can be contaminated very quickly. Um, oh, here's the testing three times during the season. This is, this is of course, the FISMA regulations, the Food Safety Modernization Act. Well water at a minimum annually, but two to three times per season is required. Here in uh, First District Health Unit, three times a year, well, okay, once a month, <coughs> monthly, right? If, it's, if it touches food contact surfaces or if it touches produce? If it touches food contact surfaces or produce in First District Health Unit, you want to test it monthly. Um, public water annually, <coughs> um, get the results tested anyway. Okay. Testing costs range anywhere from twenty to fifty-five dollars. Be sure to follow the directions. <coughs> Check with your health district for your closest testing lab because it needs to be there within a certain uh, number of hours or days. Take the water sample at the right location and be aware of that time factor. Evaluating risks: three main impact points for uh, produce safety when it comes to water: production water, watering in your fields. Um, public water supply, groundwater, surface water are all different uh, sources of water that you could use for production and the testing frequency and sampling locations are important there. How you put it on, water does not contact the harvestable portion, you're safer, less risk. The more it contacts the harvestable portion, the more risk there is. Um, and the timing, at planting or close to harvest, more risk before harvest, less risk. Public water supplies are treated to meet drinking water standards, but distribution systems vary. We talked about this. Assess your connection. Test the water if you have any concerns about your water source and have a backup plan if you think water in the distribution system may be unsafe. Inspect your well to ensure that it's in good condition. Some of our wells are, are, can get older. Inspect the well head to ensure that it is properly capped and elevated. Be sure land slopes away from the well head to prevent runoff contamination into the well and install backflow prevention devices. Corrective measures. If there is a problem with your water, be very cautious until you know more. Reinspect the water system for contamination sources. Use corrective actions. Contact your health department or the testing agency to ask them what they recommend to solve the problem that you're seeing in your water. 
keep in mind all of the regulations and implement strategies to prevent contamination from happening. Confirm that the chan changes were effective by going back and monitoring it again. You know, did you need to change the slope around your well? Did you need to change, um, did you need to put in a backflow preventer? Did you need to change what was in the bottom of the well pit? Which is part of my problem, I think. I think I had snakes and salivators on there. Mm -hmm. I think that was part of my issue. Record keeping. Keep required records such as the findings of the inspections and your water test results. The times that you monitor it. Yep, we went out, we checked the well pit, we checked the well cap. It looks fine. Corrective measures that you take, if any. And if you come across any scientific data or information that supports your compliance, it doesn't hurt to stick that in there as well. How you irrigate makes a difference. We just talked about that with Claire Sue's question about um, trickle tape. Uh, and this is the order of risk. When you overhead water, in fact, overhead watering with vegetables is not recommended and in some cases is not allowed because it has a higher risk. Direct water application onto the portion that will be harvested is the highest risk. Surface watering or ferro watering, furrow watering, we don't do a lot of that in North Dakota. We just really don't. We don't see much of it here. You might see some in like a high tunnel or a greenhouse, but we really don't see it out in the fields as much. We do have a lot of people that are using trickle tape or um, surface, subsurface micro uh, irrigation. That is a lower risk, as I mentioned, because it generally does not come into contact with the harvestable portion. Less contact with water equals lower risk. If I had been teaching this, and I was, three years ago, I stood in front of a group of people that were CSA growers and I said, you know, if you can get your customers to take your product unwashed, you are eliminating a ton of risks. Problem is people don't like their produce unwashed. They want it clean and pretty and uniform and shiny like they see in the grocery stores, right? So since the consumers aren't going to fall for it, they're not going to go for it, you have to use water, you have to wash them up. Um, the one thing we do want to remember is making sure that the, the water is potable, clean, um, and tested, and that is the water applied using a direct water application method um, when it's in the field? If the answer is never, the risk is low. If the answer is yes, the type of commodity, is it tomatoes or is it carrots, um, makes a difference. Also, the timing and application should be reviewed to assess risk. <coughs> you know, are you harvesting, like this is a, a, like a spinach leaf? Are you watering and coming in contact with those spinach leaves right before you, you harvest, or are you doing it a couple of days in advance? So timing is important as well. So now on to post-harvest water. Why focus on post-harvest? We can't eliminate every food safety risk in the field. We can do what we can, but we're not going to get rid of them all. So the next thing that we do after we pick our stuff is we wash it, right? To make it beautiful uh, for our customers. Post-harvest water has the potential to spread contamination very <coughs> widely. Post-harvest water uses, we rinse things, we wash things. Um, sometimes we use it to move produce from one area to the next. We use it for cooling, to bring down the field heat, right? Um, to, to make them cool so they'll last on the shelf longer. Some places where it is allowed, we use it for ice making. There, that's a whole separate issue. Um, we use it for hand washing and our hands touch the produce and we use it for cleaning and sanitizing. Okay. The key thing is the quality at the start. You want it tested. Also pH can affect the effectiveness of micro antimicrobial um, sanitizers. Temperature must be monitored to minimize potential for infiltration and turbidity. Turbidity is how dirty is that water, right? pH. Water pH can affect the efficacy of sanitizers, especially chlorine. I think that's one of the things most of the producers I work with, although they may be using chlorine water to sanitize things, 
Um, and they're doing it right, they're using the test strips, they know they're mixing it appropriately. One of the things that they're maybe not monitoring is the pH of the water, which will also affect the um, effectiveness of your chlorine. I'm not gonna go through each of the um, effects of this, but I have put a resource in your booklets. Let me get to it here. Here we go. Um, page 29 and page 27 um, both talk about the use of chlorine. So 27 and 29. You want to make sure that you have pH step test strips or a handheld pH meter to test the pH of your water so you can make sure you're using your sanitizers effectively. Adding chlorine um, and other sanitizers changes that pH, so know that as well. Monitor your treatment and adjust your pH as needed. Um, each sanitizer has different ways um, and different things you need to monitor. Most people in North Dakota use chlorine and bleach. It's, it's inexpensive and it's effective. There are other things that you can use, yes. Um, I have a few organic growers that say, ooh, you know, I don't, I don't want to be bleaching everything, so I'm going to use this Omri Organic, uh, National Organic Program Standard Approved Peroxide. Let me just give you my insight on that peroxide. We, we have and have used it because we are certified organic in some portions of our operation at the college. The container of the peroxide based sanitizer fell over and ate through my concrete floor. I guarantee you if my bleach container had fallen over, it would not have eaten through my concrete floor. So, yeah. what? Yeah. Isn't chlorine allowed under organic? Anyway, it used, it used to be chlorine itself was considered an acceptable thing to apply to organic. That's what it says right here. Use chlorine bleach for sanitizing raw fruits and vegetables. Is approved? I'm talking even okay. like well, with, with your organic standards. Organic. Like if you're organic. It doesn't say organic though. And uh, and there was a big debate there. at one point, and so we were because we try and walk the walk of our producers. Yeah. We had a lot of producers saying they didn't want to use chlorine. We were trying to. You know, test it out, and yeah, it ate through our concrete floor. So, um, just because it's on the organic standards uh, list doesn't mean that it's necessarily less caustic. Um, I personally trust bleach more so. Um, anyway, any water treatment, including use of sanitizer, must be monitored. Check with the supplier if you have any questions. That's a big one. Monitoring can include tools such as oxidation reduction potential sensors. There are a couple mm -hmm. that will install those. I don't know if this pertains, but I remember my mom used to do this all the time when she would get uh, vegetables and stuff from the store, and um, she'd always fill up the sink with water and, and pour uh, uh, bacon powder on it. Oh, baking soda. <coughs> baking soda? Yeah, baking, baking soda. soda. Yeah. yeah. Got any response to that, Jamie? Baking soda water? As a sanitizer? Not right. Okay, so since most of us are going to be using chlorine bleach, um, I'm going to walk back here and grab my bleach containers. It's 4.15, so I don't think I'm going to make you mix bleach water because you know what? I think you kind of got a handle on that, most of you. But I do want to talk about What bleach is the right bleach, and how do we use it? First of all, do not purchase, and these are getting very uh, popular on the market, um, do not purchase the scented bleach or the splashless. It's, it's difficult to find nowadays the ones that aren't either splashless or um, Scented. The other thing you want to make sure, and you can see I've got several, let's see, this one is the same as that one, a couple different kinds here, is all bleach is not created equal. This one, sodium hypochloride, is 8.25%. <coughs> this one 
is, uh oh, I had one that was six. This one is also 8.25. This one. This one. This one is 6%. So you want to make sure that you read your ingredient label so that you're mixing it appropriately. If you're like me and you have a standard operating procedure that says, if I fill my sink, my sanitizer sink, with water to this point, I need two tablespoons of bleach to, to make it 200 parts per million, which is where I want it, right? Okay, now I go out and I buy bleach and I haven't read the label and it's 6%. I'm no longer getting that same concentration. So make sure that you are reading the concentration on the label. The other thing you want to look at on the label is, is it labeled for um, contact with food prep surfaces? Did I say that correctly, Jamie? Yes. You don't want to be using a bleach that is not labeled for um, food contact surfaces because that's not going to be good for anybody, right? So make sure that it has it on the label. Now, Jamie and I had this conversation earlier about um, using lightly bleached water to um, sanitize your produce itself. And we, we were talking about the fact that you're never going to find that on the label of something you purchase off a box store shelf, okay? If you go to a, maybe a restaurant supply store or a commercial place that sells sanitizers, you might find it. Okay. But um, if you're going shopping at the grocery store or the local box store, you're not going to find on the label how to mix it for washing produce. But if that label says it is okay for food contact surfaces and you mix it appropriately, then you're okay to use it on your produce. Now one of your handouts has the appropriate target um, uh, amounts, parts per million of chlorine that you want to mix in your water for a variety of vegetables. <coughs> and I think that's the page 29. Yeah, page 29, it talks about the chlorine strength, parts per million and the produce type. Now, of course, everything's not listed there, but it will give you some ideas, right? And how do we measure parts per million? We do that with test strips. The uh, bleach sanitizer test strips, I purchased mine right here in Minot <coughs> Restaurant Supply. Um, if they have them on hand, you can get them on the internet, um, you can get them in, in a variety of places. Usually one little container of them is gonna last you a very long time. However, be aware that they do have an expiration date. Um, so check that periodically, it's, it's long. It's like, you know, when cotton balls have an expiration date, you know, right? Um, but you, you wanna make sure that you check that periodically so that you have good test strips so you're not getting false readings, okay? Basically, if you're using chlorine to sanitize your non-porous surfaces, your countertops, your tools, your totes, things like that, 200 parts per million. Correct, Jamie? Is that what you? 50 to 200 is fine. 50 to 200 is fine? Yes, okay. for food contact services. Um, and then looking at the chart, most of them are at the 100 to 150 range for vegetables. This was an ultra Clorox label that I found, brand of regular bleach that actually said for fruit and vegetable washing. <coughs> I put that on there because I actually, but I found that one in Florida. You know, I, I have not seen that one up here. So now up there though, it says rinse fruit with potable water prior to packaging. So after they sanitize, you rinse it again. Yes, yes. Thank you, Clarice. That's exactly what you want to do. Um, Time here. Um, chlorine is common. Non chlorine uh, things are optional. Organic formulations are available. Tsunami, Spectrum, Sanidate, Bigger. Um, I want to make sure and point out that some of these items, although they are available, may not be approved if you are seeking a license 
with your health district. Say that again. Okay. If you, if we're going above the cottage food laws and we're, we're going to get licensed to sell produce to restaurants or whatever, your personal health district might not see these, um, some of these brand names as a viable sanitizer for your <coughs> area. They may say, no, we are unfamiliar with this or whatever. Now, in some cases, you may be able to find enough information on these things to take back to them and say, here's some scientific data that shows what it does, and they may improve it, but um, it's, it's up to, if you're using something out of the ordinary, it's up to your local health district licensing agency. Yes, Jane. What we go with is if the label, the manufacturer's label for a product includes a specific use on that label, we allow it to be used for that. Because in order to get that label, they have to submit it to the <coughs> get approval for it. So if the label says it's approved for use on produce, then we would accept that, or if it was approved for use on food contact surfaces, we would accept that. Not all of them are approved by your organic certifier, and again, same thing there. If you are certified organic, check with your certifier. But in any and all cases, it must be labeled for the proper use. Okay. When should you change your water? This is called turbidity. Post harvest water must be managed, including changing it when necessary, water changing schedules. Um, or when you, the things you consider when you're thinking about when should I change my water are organic load, how much soil is, is in that wash tub, turbidity, how, how clear is the water, can I see through the water, um, the volume of produce, are you just putting in a couple of uh, bunches of carrots at a time or are you dumping in a whole big tote of carrots, right? The type of produce, is it a leafy green like Walter's Grow that is really going to suck up a lot or, or retain a lot of that moisture, or is it something harder like a potato, okay? The product flow and operating conditions, the type of product you're using, is it tsunami or is it uh, chlorine bleach? And the type of equipment you're using, all of those are considerations. The waste water from produce washing or cooling must be disposed of properly so that it does not serve as a source for contamination for your produce. You want to make sure that it is not going back into your production area. You want to make sure it's not going back into an area where you're going to track it on your shoes back into the production area, um, outside of your, your uh, wash station area as well. Hand washing stations, we talked about those having <coughs> catch basins for the water. <coughs> and check your state, local, and EPA regulations on whether or not you can put it back into the sewer if you're in town. Some uh, city, Regulations say you can't, just like you can't pump your um, sump pump back into the septic system in some cities, um, same thing would go for your wash water. Um, SOPs for post harvest water management, monitoring and adding microbial product. When do we do that? Um, monitoring and modifying pH, monitoring water and pulp temperatures, monitoring the turbidity. So what we're saying on this slide is, what would I include in my standard operating procedure? Our standard operating procedure at our farm says that our wash water for the herbs will be changed <coughs> after every tub of basil. If it's the, the smaller herbs that we don't do in such large quantity, it will be changed after every variety. So in other words, we're going to wash the rosemary, then we're going to change it. Then we're going to wash the oregano, then we're going to change it. Um, and those things that we do in large quantities, like basil, dill, cilantro, it's by the tub. You know, it's every time we do a tub, we're going to change the water again. Okay. That's standard operating procedure at, at our farm. Yours may be different depending on the size of wash tub you have, the product that you're washing, and the, the water that you're using. Okay, soil amendments. This is my buddy Tim Geinert from Geinert Gardens down in the southeast part of the state. Soil are amendments, basically anything you add to your soil. Basically anything you add to your soil to improve the soil and support plant growth. Sometimes we think of soil amendments just as manure, or just as compost, or just as chemical fertilizers, but basically you'd be surprised at the things that can be added. Um, they may do all of these things, you know, reduce erosion, make better tilt, make better water holding capacity. Um, and 
All of those things are good, but they can also present some risks. So quickly, you want to assess your risks. Remember, that was number one. These are the questions you want to ask yourself when you're assessing your risks for soil amendments. What type of soil amendment are you using? What crops are getting it? When do you apply them? How do you apply it? <coughs> how much and how often do you apply it? Chemical soil amendments. They have a min minimal risk of human pathogens. And chemical soil amendments, we're talking about chemical fertilizers, um, maybe some pesticides if you're using them, but they can't be considered 100% safe. Keep in mind that those uh, chemical soil amendments mostly have gone through quite a rigorous testing um, to ensure that if you follow the label and you're doing it appropriately, that they are minimizing the risk, but they're not 100% safe. Um, they can put a chemical risk to you if you don't use them appropriately. Maybe you're not using protective eyewear or protective gloves like you should be, wearing protective clothing, um, or you're not applying it appropriately, or it's North Dakota, that wind, you're out there, you're spraying, and all of a sudden, you, you thought to yourself, perfect, <clears throat> it's not windy, I can go and spray this, and by the time you get to the other end of the field, it's blowing it right back in your face, right? So it's not always 100% safe. Make sure that you follow all proper label and your proper labeling and storage. Human waste is prohibited for use on produce crops. And people always say, well, duh, right? Duh. What's a human waste that gets put on produce crops <coughs> all the time? You think of one? No way. Urine. What? Urine. Urine. Um, the bagged comes, you can buy it at the box stores, the hardware stores. Milorganite. That's Milwaukee sewage. Did you know that? Um, the other human waste that sometimes gets applied is if you are like me and you live in the rural uh, areas of our state, and they're not supposed to do this, but they do, they come to pump your empty tank. And what's the first thing that pumper's going to ask you? Can I pump it in your field? Absolutely. And that's exactly what they do. They go to the other side of the trees and they pump it up in the field. Now, we are very specific with our guy and we say, no, it is not allowed. You must take it with you. You must take it far, far away. But, yes, Jamie. And in the state, they can't dump it legally on fields. I mean, they can. That's, that's an approved way of disposing of septic tank pumpings. They can apply them. There's, there's criteria for how far from roads, how far from water. But uh, they'll go out there and put them down on the ground. That's it's okay to do. I have one row of evergreens. That's it. One row of evergreen evergreens separating my production lot from the field that they would put in. That's not enough for me to feel safe. You know, so it happens. Um, human waste prohibited for use on produce. Untreated human waste contains pathogens, heavy metals. Uh, other contaminants like pharmaceuticals may not be accepted by your produce buyers if you do that. Um, so beware of that. pre consumer <coughs> educated waste. Can I say something? Yes. Uh, you know, in the past we've heard of some others talking about humaner. Okay. Just composted. Human, human waste. Waste. And of course, I'm going to say no, but you know, Jamie, is that anything? Is, it, is there any? If you're regulated by us, you can't use any human waste in yeah. any way for manure, or any other purpose on your food. There's no way of composting it. Nope. I mean, it, it's like a <coughs> garden thing. That's why I bring it up. I certainly. So. I and I've seen some of those survivalist shows too, where they're going out and they're pooping in their garden and covering it up. And, yeah. Gray water irrigation would be no. Yeah. Also, can't yeah. do any of that. Even subsurface. Yeah. Don't want to do that. Okay. So, pre-consumer vegetative waste. What is it? I know some <coughs> producers that collect uh, vegetable waste from restaurants, or particularly from grocery stores, and they use that um, and and try to compost that down, or they till it into their fields as a soil mint. All right, so what it is is produce food preparation waste, um, out of date vegetables, grocery stores have a lot of those, food products that have been removed from their packaging. 
when you're using those, um, they're not zero risk. Even though they are not animal based, keep in mind that that doesn't mean they haven't been treated with chemicals of some kind, that they haven't come in contact with some sort of contamination along the route, and that's why they were thrown away in the first place. Um, think about it when they remove those first leaves of the lettuce or the cabbage at the grocery store to make it look prettier. Where is that contamination highest? Where has it been touched the most? Those outside leaves that have been touched by every person that comes along, right? They got to pick it up. Oh no, that's not the one, and put it down and pick it up, okay? So um, not zero risk, even though they're not animal based, but you want to be aware of what you're doing when you're doing it. Non manure based soil amendments of animal origin. First time I saw this, I went, what? Um, bone meal, blood meal, fish emulsion, most commonly used in our area, other areas um, in the nation. Some people use feather meal. I had not heard of that. Interesting to me, but make sure that it's processed to eliminate pathogens. If you are buying it at your local nursery, garden center, or wherever you're getting it from, make sure you read your label and that it's not raw, that it has been processed to eliminate those pathogens. Um, or if it's not, you have to consider it an untreated biological soil, which you don't want to use. Manure, we all know the values of manure, it builds soil, it builds water holding capacity, it builds till, um, builds the micro environment. Um, all of those things are wonderful, but they do come with a risk. All manures from all animals can carry human pathogens. Some animals tend to be just reservoirs, for just walking reservoirs for human pathogens. And many things can affect the animals shedding those pathogens into their manure, including age, rearing practice, diet, season, and environmental conditions. So, I mean, if, if you happen to know all those things about your animals, that's great. But if you're getting manure from someplace else, you may not know what was going on with those animals at the time. Untreated biological soil amendments, untreated manure or other animal-based, um, the bone meal, blood meal, are considered high risk since they have not been treated to eliminate the pathogens. All of the following soil amendments would be considered untreated. Raw manure, and we talked about this at the very beginning, the first, um, the most missed question on the produce safety training test is about compost. People thought that aged or stacked manure could be considered compost, and it's not. It's still manure. I don't care if it's been there 30 years. If it hasn't been, followed in the process, time and temperature wise, to make it into compost, it's still manure. Untreated manure slurries, we hear a lot about teas, manure tea, right? That's considered an untreated soil amendment. Agricultural teas, we talked there. And any soil amendment that was mixed with raw manure, oh, but it's chopped straw that we mixed with raw manure. Mostly just straw, no. If there's any manure in there and it hasn't been composted appropriately, it's untreated raw. Now, composting is a controlled process. Temperature is the primary control method of pathogen reduction. Um, however, chemical and biological factors also contribute. Only a composting process that has been scientifically validated ensures pathogen reduction. This is why I don't go into composting here because there are several different methods to composting, um, several different recipes, if you will, that are scientifically proven and validated that can be used. So I don't want to say, oh, this is the only one when there's others out there. Process monitoring and record keeping are critical. You must use a scientifically valid process. Here's a few, even though I said I'm gonna go into them, not gonna spend long. Aerated static composting, minimum of 131 degrees for three days. Turned composting, which is aerobic, 131 degrees for 15 days with five turnings, followed by curing, or other methods that are out there. So if you're going to compost it yourself, make sure you're following the process. Make sure that you are keeping record of the time that you composted things, the temperatures they reached, how many turnings you did, and other steps in the process. If you're going to compost it yourself. 
The steps you should take to reduce the risk, um, preferentially apply soil amendments containing manure to crops not intended for fresh consumption. What we do at our place is we make sure that we put the manure on, um, we alternate, okay? We don't use all of our field all the time. We put half in cover crop, half in production. If we use manure, which isn't every year, we put it on the half that's not being used for production and won't be for another year to year and a half, okay? Maximize the time between application and harvest. Um, the question came up just the other day in our Food Safety Modernization Act meeting, whether that was still the 120, 190 day organic rule. So far, the federal government is saying that that's the rule. 120 days from application and tilling it in to when you harvest something off that land. Um, do not side dress with raw manure and minimize risk to adjacent crops if you're, if you're spreading it, if you have a spreader and it's flying around, make sure that you minimize uh, access to the other crops. Designate specific equipment and tools for handling soil amendments. Just like my special poop, scoop, and shovel. There are specific equipment. Now, we know on, on our farm, if there's anything that's coming out of the compost pile, you need to take a shovel out of the closet. Because the closet for us is basically storage of things that we don't use in the production line. Um, so that's where that equipment needs to come from. Develop standard operating procedures to clean and sanitize equipment and tools that contact soil amendments and fresh produce. So if you don't have a place or enough tools to say this one is specifically for soil amendments, then what you want to do is come up with a standard operating procedure that says after it's done being used for that, we're going to wash it, we're going to sanitize it, and we're going to put it back in a clean spot up with that process because I'll tell you you know how easy it is I've mentioned the buckets before to right now we have to haul water for the sheep okay and my husband isn't always great about grabbing the right bucket he grabs the bucket that's close and he fills it with water and he hauls it out to the barn and what does he do he, he sets it down he opens the gate he goes in he picks it up he sets it down by the water he cuts oh what a cute little lamb picks it up pours it in and brings it back to my wash pack <gasps> it's now been sitting in sheep poop okay so even though it has a big x on it it says don't do that so you want to make sure that you have those standard operating procedures to clean and sanitize our standard operating procedure is at the beginning of the season, anything that's going to touch any produce, whether in the field or in the wash pack, it all gets washed, rinsed, sanitized, air dried. Direct traffic, foot traffic around soil amendment storage and processing areas can also be a risk. Make sure that you have enough room between your compost pile or your manure pile and your production lot so that you're not walking past it through it or around it to get there all the time. I know when you're like us and you do everything hand labor and it comes in a wheelbarrow and you have to pitchfork it yourself that having it as close as possible. My husband is great at saying, how many times are we going to move this crap? Okay, because we move it a lot of times, specifically for this reason, because I don't want it stored in a place where I'm going to have to walk through and around it to get to the field. So keep those things in mind. Also, that North Dakota wind blows, right? And what happens? It blows right up and over that manure pile and straight onto your field. So think about things like that when you're placing. Um, we've talked about minimizing runoff. Do not store in locations that are likely to experience runoff. Um, keep finished compost separate from your raw compost and minimize animal access to the compost piles. Um, make sure that you keep records of the type and source of your soil amendment, the rate and the date of application and the handling and sanitation practices. Um, there are a few records required for treated biological soil amendments um, with the produce safety rules, so if you fall within that, make sure you follow those. Um, this is the one, though, that I do want to talk about. If you're buying, because not all of us have animals on the farm, and so we buy compost, the first thing you want to do is make sure that what you're buying is truly compost. Get records of how they treated it. If it is truly compost, they will have records of what temperature, how many days, 
you know, how, how did they turn it, how many times it got turned. Um, so ask that company for a record of um, how it was composted and keep that with your records. Don't lose it somewhere. So make sure as long as well as their name and address of the supplier, the date and amount of purchase, the lot information is available, and then what field you put it on and where you used it. Oh, then domestic and wild animals. We've talked a lot about these over the course of the, the day. Um, and, and we know that we're never going to keep them all out, but they can carry E. coli, Salmonella, Salmonella Listeria. Um, they can spread human pathogens, and they can be very difficult to control. Can they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wildlife on the farm can be a natural, valuable part. Um, you know, if we had some of our NRCS folks or our Forest Service people here, um, they'd be saying, we want wildlife. We do want wildlife. They increase our, our natural habitat and our environment immensely. Um, but depending on the species, we, we may end up with an overabundance of them or in places we don't want them. Um, and those that are in close uh, association with us as humans pose a greater risk. So, find wildlife feces on your produce fields. If so, think about how often is it wildly, widely distributed and it is in contact with your produce. We talked about that. One of the things you'll find, especially with migrating animals, you know, you think about it, are they migrating through? Is it not, you know, it's the geese that are coming through in the spring and they're only going to be here for a couple of weeks and they move on. Okay. Or is it deer? And they always cut across this same path right here. We had that um, in our last location. We moved our farm in 2011. We had a spot that the deer came through every day. Boom, 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 like clockwork. That's, that, that was their path. So what we did was we went out, uh, talked to the soil conservation people, bought some cheap uh, apple, crab apple type of trees, planted them on the other side as bait, and then the deer just by themselves changed their route to go, oh, apple trees, cool, buffet, right? Um, and we didn't have a problem with them anymore. Um, what management practices can limit wildlife containment? You know, we're not telling you to, to go out and build a huge fence, um, but maybe short fence se sections might be enough to deter some wildlife. During the season, monitor uh, for feces, evaluate the risk, Consider past observations. Our wildlife patterns changed dramatically on our farm when they removed the shelter belts around our farm. This, two years ago, they took out three great big shelter belts that were on to the north and south of us. All of a sudden, we had wildlife patterns we had not had before. Um, so we had to consider where else do they have to go. They now have different movements. Where are they on their way to? always go out immediately prior to harvest to monitor this. Uh, that's the best time to look for it, right before you pick, because you don't want to be picking along and then all of a sudden, ah, oh, there it is, I can see it. Now you got to stop, you have to wash your hands, you have to get that, you have to remove it, you have to wash your hands. You've just slowed yourself down for the day, right? And that's when we're trying to be the fastest. Lots of ways to deter wildlife, decoys, fencing and netting, um, relocation, if possible, noise deterrence, tactile repellent, um, visual deterrence. I like, I want one of those. Doesn't that just make you happy to see that guy out in the field every day? Hi, good morning. Come out and pick. We talked a little bit about domesticated animals, um, specifically like dogs or pets, but draft animals are also used by some of our producers. You want to keep in mind um, that using draft animals in your field could result in fecal manner. So there are ways to manage your draft animals, to minimize that, and then you're going to have to make sure that you appropriately clean up after those draft animals. Domesticated animals um, should not be allowed in your production field. I see this all the time with my producers. I mentioned our farm dog. Um, she knows the edge of the production lot. She, I don't care if she's chasing a deer full tilt. 
she gets to that production lot and she stops and she runs around because that's what she's been trained. She doesn't go in there. She will stand, actually we lay at the edge of the production lot so still, just waiting for that gopher to come out of the field because she knows she doesn't belong there. Okay. Um, Workers should be aware of cross-contamination risks, not be petting things, handling animals, that sort of thing, um, when they're harvesting produce. Um, and also, keep in mind if you are rotating your grazing land or land that has animals on it into production area, say you're, you're rotating like we do, but we put animals on ours, um, that you want to make sure that you are giving enough time for that manure to be worked into the soil. If it's present on the ground, you want it to be decomposed enough that you can till it in, that it's not going to come in contact with your produce. Talked about pets. Talked about visitors and their pets. Um, farms with petting zoos should have hand washing sinks available and signage instructions for visitors about food safety policies. Here's your pre-harvest assessment. If it's present, look for tracks, look for trampling, look for rutting, look for feeding. Um, don't harvest when it's contacted. Corrective actions, make sure you have a no harvest buffer zone if necessary. And um, make sure that the probes, you can safely proceed with harvest. Um, determine if a no harvest buffer zone, do I need to not harvest within two feet, three feet? Was it just on that one tomato? Is it just that plant? Um, make sure that you are uh, appropriately determining where you can harvest to not come in contact with that contaminated produce. <coughs> Suggested no harvest buffer zones vary from zero to 25 foot radius, excuse me, depending on the crop, climate, the contamination event, and the harvest equipment. Make a decision about what to do with it, leave it, bury it, use other strategies, um, <coughs> consider risks that could result from that action, and document your actions. Equipment and tools, this is a big one. Um, we kind of whizzed right through the uh, wildlife because we've talked about that in other areas, but there are certain things when it comes to equipment and tools that we want to discuss. It's very uh, helpful and important to have two sets, if you can, of tools or totes. Ones that can go out into the field and can be set on the ground and can be considered contaminated or dirty totes. And ones that are only used for clean and washed produce. Now, up at the college, we have two different colors that they use. They use yellow ones for out in the field, yellow meaning caution, this has been set on the ground, or, or this might be dirty. And they have green ones, meaning go, it's good, all is well, for the once finished, washed, clean, sanitized produce. Okay. At my house, I also have different colored ones. The black ones can go out in the field, the clear ones go back into the cooler and the wash pack. Very handy to, to do that. Make sure that you wash, rinse, and sanitize all equipment that's going to come in contact with your produce right down to if you're using a trailer. You know, if you're doing something like pumpkins or squash or sweet corn and you're, you're putting it right into a trailer, wash it and sanitize that trailer out as well. Um, your packing house or processing facility, um, it's accessed by authorized personnel only. Don't just let every plumber and neighborhood farmer and neighbor kid go running in there because you don't know where their shoes have been, right? You're washing and packing or processing line, make sure you use portable water. We talked about that. Portable water hoses and you have your testing records. Make sure you're monitoring your water temperature if needed. We didn't talk a lot about water temperature, but if your water, there's too big of a difference between the temperature of your water and the temperature of your produce. That produce water in, right? Um, it is also going to affect the effectiveness of your corn. So monitor your temperature if needed. 
Paint water change and sanitizer use if required. Um, line up your clean and sanitize. Line clean. Line clean. And, oh, line clean and sanitize and record it. Uh, all of your tubs, all of the things that you're putting produce into. You want them when it says line clean. We're talking wash, detergent, rinse with clean water, sanitize with your chlorine water if that's what you're doing, and then air dry. That's the process. Okay? And you want to make sure you got a little check mark in the box that says you did that. Lubricants, if you're using anything that needs a lubricant. On our farm, I don't sell it, but maybe someday I might. I have an apple press, a fruit press. Okay? And when we press our apples, that's what we use. The lubrication for that mechanism needs to be food grade lubricant. You want to make sure you do general housekeeping. I mentioned that, you know, is there mouse droppings anywhere? Do we have spiders? You're on the farm. Spiders are everywhere, right? Some years. Box elder bugs. Holy cow, right? <laughs> <laughs> you want to make sure that, that you do that look around in your wash pack space and say, yes, there's, you know, Charlotte the spider hasn't made a big web up in the corner that says nice pig, right? Um, you want to take care of those. General housekeeping. Your floor is clean. It's washed and clean. Um, your, your, don't want your produce contacting the floor once it's clean. Keep it up, off the ground. And we mentioned pest control. So now your plan. It gets you thinking about your farm and the practices you use. It keeps you organized so you can focus your time and resources. It gives you a plan to follow that assures everyone is involved. It documents your progress. Is required sometimes by third-party audits. If you are, if your customers are demanding you have a good agricultural practices audit, or if you're being audited because you're becoming certified organic, um, you will be required to have a plan. It is not, and this is the second most common missed question on the produce safety test. A farm food safety plan is not required by this month, but it's a good idea. Um, reasons we talked about that way, we talked about all that. Online, you can go to Cornell and they have an online decision tree, which is set up a little bit different than the one that you have in your booklet. It basically is a series of yes or no questions. Do you do this? Yes. Okay, it's going to lead you to a checklist. It's going to lead you to some sample standard operating procedures. No, it's going to stick you, send you to the next area. So if you're the type of person that works really good on yes, no questions, this might be the place to go to get a sample of a food safety plan. It's pretty easy to work with. Really like that one. Here's an example of it. Do you hire any workers, including non-paid family members? Yes. Uncle Joe comes out, right? Okay, so there you are. We have a yes. We're coming down. Have all the workers received training? That includes you and Uncle Joe. No, okay, well, here you go. Here's what you need to have. So all the pages in that particular decision tree type of plan work off of this yes, no sort of piece and end with a piece that suggests how you can write it into your farm food safety plan. You have to have a person who is designated your farm food safety person. Each farm should have that person to lead the development. Um, you may need a backup person just in case. Um, that person should have some sort of food safety training experience um, to know how to assess risks, how to write a standard operating procedure. They have to have the authority to make necessary changes. Okay? Um, you must make sure the plan is implemented. It doesn't do you any good to write one and stick it on the shelf and let it collect dust. It really doesn't. And you should be willing um, to be the farm food safety contact if you're the one who wrote the plan. Basic things, farm name, address, farm description, name and contact information for who's in charge, risk assessment of practices and environmental conditions, practices to reduce the risks, and record those practices. In the end, it's the record keeping um, that really makes it valuable for you when it comes to liability, for you when it comes to proving that you have limited risk, and for you when we're looking at um, expanding your customer base, all right? 
These are a list of all the things that it might contain. Be sure to make it your own. We talked about that really early on in the session. Only include practices you are doing. Don't write it in there if you're not going to do it. Don't do it just to make it look good. Don't do it just to pass inspection. Don't do it just to please the neighbors. If you're not doing it, don't put it in there. Um, it doesn't need to be long or complicated. It can be really short. Pick practices you know that you can get done and that you can get done every time. And focus on your risk reduction because a one-page plan that focuses on the worst risks is better, that gets followed all the time, is better than a 50-page plan that nobody looks at, right? So how do you talk to your customers about it? Your food safety plan uh, and measures can be used as a marketing tool. Recognize that, that your customers might not be as aware of the regulations and food safety steps in the field and in, in production lots as you are. We find this a lot with rural grocers. We find this a lot with school personnel. We even find it, believe it or not, with restaurant people. They just are not aware. So you are the one, you're the marketing person that can go in and say, here's a copy of my farm food safety plan. It shows all the things that I do to make my product safer and to make sure that it's safe for your customers. Okay? It's a great marketing tool. Show them the plan and go from there. Some individual companies may have their own rules. I mentioned that before. They may require you to have one. These are just a few acknowledgments of the people um, that I work with on the Food Safety Modernization Act. Jamie Calvera is on there as well. Thank you very much, Jamie. <coughs> we have five minutes left. We do need to take that very quick post uh, survey, but I want to see if there are any questions that anybody has about anything that we covered. Can we go back to talking about safety at the farmer's market stand? Because all this work, yeah, we say that when we get there and somebody comes along and they're touching in the stand and the stand and the stand and then someone else comes along and they get sick, they get that person is sick. So do you have special gloves for them? Do you by yourself? Do you just require they wait while you're packaging things up or the question she's asking is about food safety at the farmer's market stand because we've all watched it haven't we not only at the farmer's market stand but in the grocery store itself they go in they pick up that tomato they squeeze it they look at it they smell it they put it back down and they pick up another one and you don't know where they're you know your hands are clean <coughs> excuse me but you don't know where their hands are clean. good question now up until i mean i honestly have not seen any federal, state, or local place address that, all right? Um, I know that what people have been relying on is the fact that the, the food safety message has been going out to consumers for years, whether it's from the grocery store or the farmer's market, always watch your produce, right? And that's why. Um, I don't know of any farmer's market that has implemented any rules or regulations, and personally, I don't know of any diversified produce people that have put anything in place to, to fix that. Now, my husband and I are returning back to the farmer's market this year after being wholesale for a long time. We have leafy greens, we do herbs, we have big tubs of them, and that used to absolutely drive us insane. We used to um, put a little sign up on our booth that said, please let us get a sample for you. Does it smell nice? Please let us get a sample for you, okay? So that we could limit that a little bit. It didn't help much, I'll be really honest to say it did. Um, when we go back to the farmer's market this time, we have decided we're actually going to install a sneeze guard. We're gonna buy a piece of clear plexiglass, you know, about like this big, and we're going to bolt it into our canopy on either side at table height, so that, you know, from the table up about like this, they can see it, they can see us packaging it, and if they want a sample, I will certainly hand them one over the guard, but nobody's gonna be going anymore at my stand. Now, how you can do that with, you know, cucumbers, because people like to pick it up, they wanna feel how heavy it is, they wanna know that it's solid, they know that it wanna know it's not soft. I don't know, um, other than, you know, Making sure that you say, please make sure you wash your produce when you get home. Mm -hmm. Jamie, do you have any other suggestions for that? Uh, 
Guy, I got nothing. He says, hey, thanks. Yes, Peggy. We package a lot of our things. Pre-packaged. Yep, yep. Just sticking them in the bag ahead of time. You know, like we'll sell five pounds of cucumbers at a time, but they're already packaged up, and nobody cares if they're what they look like or anything. Yeah, we'll take that. Yep. Pre-packaging is a great way yeah. to do it in some markets. Now, being a person who works with farmers markets all across the state, I can tell you the the clientele vary in what they like and how they like to buy things immensely. When we first started selling at the Grand Forks Farmers Market, we prepackaged because we didn't like that going on, right? So we prepackaged, came home with every one of them because we discovered that in that particular market, they want to get the experience. They want to see it, you know, piled high and deep and touch it and smell it and, you know, if they can, if it's cherry tomato, taste it and do all of those things. They don't want it prepackaged. They're there for the experience. Um, but then I have seen other farmers markets like yours and actually Capital Farmers Market in Bismarck um, is very much like that too. People there aren't really there for their ex the experience, they're there for the food. They want, they're busy, they just got off work, they want to come in, they want to grab those packages, get the heck out, go home and cook them. Okay? So it really varies from market to market and what your customers are like. But yes, pre-packaging would be, uh, yes, would help a lot. We do both. I mean, yeah. There's some people that have We'll take it and go, and there's others that are going to, yeah. I mean, we don't prepackage everything. No, right. But, you know, some of the things we do. Right. And it works. Other questions? Comments? Concerns? So, what is a, to get a well tested or anything, what's the charge on it if we come in and get a sample bottle from you? There's 22. 22. Yeah. 22? Okay. And he does have the little white boxes on the back table. There are the sample um, bottles, sampling kits, and feel free to take one of those and remember that that kit is good for a long time so as you don't crack the seal on it. Um, you know, so if you want to take it today and not use it until just before you start harvesting or whatever, that's fine. And for a private well, we'll tell you coliform bacteria, E. coli, and nitrates. Uh, the nitrates is a specific act. I get like 2.3. But it'll be, is it less than two, is it less than 10, is it greater than 10? It'll give you an idea of the range of what you're looking at. And don't empty out the stuff on the inside of the... Yeah, the powder on the inside of the container, the bottle is supposed to be there. Yeah, no, 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 people have done that the first time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, so I used to work for North Prairie, so I know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's, like I said, there's four of them back there, but take a look. <coughs> if somebody, if you need more, let me know I can get some. Other questions, comments, or concerns? We're just saying maybe we should do like the grocery stores and have one of those wet weight things as they walk into the market. It's not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. But remember what Jamie said. They need to be wet wipes or, or sanitizer or whatever that is labeled for food contact. <coughs> you want to make sure you buy the appropriate product. Yeah. And once they touch their cell phones, that can really matter. And their money. Yeah, right. first time they pay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. We're never going to eliminate 100% of the risk. This is how I look at it every time I teach this. You know, you're never going to, unless you live in a bubble, you're never going to eliminate 100% of the risk. But everything that you can do to lessen the risk mm -hmm. not only protects your customer, it protects you. Well, even if you, just as a market, if you came up with a, a little logo that had a quick explanation, you know, so Please somebody knows kids' yeah. face with a big X <laughs> <or something, laughs> and then some reasons, and then, and have that on each, at each person's stand. Um, something. You know, every, every little thing you can do helps. Really does. I think that, and this is a shame to us, but could not believe the number of people at Friday Dakota shows that would double dip. We can't tell you how many bowls of stuff we threw away. So somebody doubled it. Not, not everybody understands or cares about the risks the way some of us do. So, yeah. Um, remember, uh, a lot of the things that are in here and that we talked about today uh, pertaining to the cottage foods law in North Dakota are subject to change that the um, public comment period should be open soon. The uh, website address for the State Department of Health Cottage Foods page is in your folder. Um, access that, make sure you understand it, make sure you give comments for 
or against, um, because that's what we'll need, is public comments to really make informed changes to that rule, to those guidance documents. Um, remember, if you're under 25,000, FISMA does not apply to you, but boy, you start getting close to that, come see me and we'll make sure that we get you compliant as quickly as possible. Um, and now you know your first district health unit person, Jamie. Um, feel free to give him a call at any time. So um, I do have a real quick end of end of thing email here. Um, my uh, contact information is in your booklets, so you can contact me if you have further questions later. Oh, I'm starting to stiffen up. It's like more aspirin or something. I got it. I got to move. That's the point. Is I'm standing still too long. Standing in one place. Um, I had some surgery done a couple three weeks ago when I was trying to get back in the spring. You got to get the lead out of the Yeah. I, I told everybody at the conference it's, it's winter and all farmers do maintenance in the winter. So that's what I was doing was maintenance.